tested positive for COVID-19 and am in quarantine uh, until Thursday. But I do want to thank uh, our town clerk, Diana Quas and Tom Ciangela uh, for putting together a hybrid uh, town board meeting to allow me to participate. And I want to thank the town board members for their help and support over the last few days. Having said that, we'll begin our meeting. If everyone could please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if we could all just bow our heads in a moment of silence, we had another difficult few days, both here in our community and across the country. We pray for healing in the town of Yorktown after another hate-filled and racist attack on the fabric of our community. And we especially pray tonight for the 14 children who were killed in Texas today in their elementary school. Thank you. Amen. Amen. May God help us. So we're trying to do this a little differently tonight. Uh, again, my apologies for not being there in person, but we'll start with introductions, beginning with our town clerk. Good evening, Diana Kloss, town clerk. <laughs> Luciana Howitt, councilwoman. Tom Diana, councilman, deputy supervisor. Ed Lachman, councilman. Sergio Esposito, councilman. Adam Rodriguez, town attorney. Thank you. Uh, we do have a long and, uh, a long and, and uh, robust agenda tonight. Uh, we are going to start with a presentation uh, by or of the American Legion post uh, 1009, as well as the Sons of American Legion post 1009. And I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Lachterman. This is uh, part of our month long uh, uh, tribute to for milita military appreciation month, recognizing the organizations in the town of Yorktown uh, who support our veterans, who support our active mem our active duty members, and support military families. Councilman Lachterman? Sure. So I would like to ask uh, the representatives that are here from our American Legion post and our sons of the American Legion to uh, approach the podium, please. And I will say that three members that are present will not be attending uh, Myself, Councilman Diana, and Supervisor Slater are all sons of the American Legion. Actually, um, Mr. Tagater, since you uh, represent the Mayapak Sons of the American Legion, why don't you step up too? So I'd like to start with a proclamation, and then if we, I will turn it over so uh, we have some uh, information about the clubs. Um, <clears throat> in appreciation of the American Legion Post 1009 and the Sons of the American Legion Squadron 1009, whereas National Military Appreciation Month, as recognized by the United States Congress, acknowledges the past and present service of American soldiers, and whereas Military Appreciation Month includes VE Day, Military Spouse Appreciation Day, Loyalty Day, Armed Forces Day, Public Service Recognition Week, and Memorial Day, and whereas the town of Yorktown greatly admires the brave men and women who served and presently serve our nation as members of the United States Armed Forces, and whereas members of the United States military make tremendous sacrifice to defend our liberties and spread freedom throughout the world, and whereas Military Appreciation Month recognizes all of our courageous neighbors serving in all branches of the service, including the National Guard, Reserves, Veterans, and all of their families, and whereas the town of Yorktown is proud of the many organizations within our community who support both active and retired military personnel, such as the American Legion Post 1009 and the Sons of the American Legion Squadron 1009, and be it resolved that the town of Yorktown offers its health, 
his heartfelt appreciation to all who defend our freedoms, and be it further resolved that I, as duly elected town supervisor of Yorktown, Matthew J. Slater, do hereby offer our thanks and appreciation and recognize the accomplishments and distinguished organizations, American Legion Post 1009 and the Sons of the American Legion Squadron 1009. At this time, I would like the uh, the post adjutant uh, Patrick McDonough to step to the podium. Oh, you're here for. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> do we need we, we need a motion to accept? First, first oh, I want. I'm sorry, Carl. Give me one second. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion to accept the proclamation? Second. So All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Sorry, I I. Uh, I Correct. It's uh, Carl the Libertor. The, Carl, you're the uh, assist, uh, first vice, vice commander. commander. First vice commander of the American Legion, post 1009. First, before we get started, I want to thank Matt for notifying me that he came down with COVID since I was here Thursday night with him and Mike Sheridan. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, just a little brief history on American Legion. It started September 16, 1919, is when Congress. Um, chartered the American Legion. Uh, today the membership is 2 million, uh, around 2 million with 13,000 posts uh, worldwide. Um, August 21, the Legion efforts result in the creation of the U.S. Veterans Bureau, forerunner of the Veterans Administration. Um, May, 3, May 1st, 1931, Yorktown Post 109 got chartered. So in about a little over eight years, we're, or nine years, we're going to be celebrating our 100th anniversary. Uh, June 23rd, 1935, the American Legion started Boys State, convenes in Springfield, Illinois, to help youths gain an, an understanding of the structure and operation of the federal government. The first Boys Nation bringing together youth leadership from all the boys' state programs, convenes, convenes in 1946. Today, more than 19,500 young men participated, boys' state, 98 in boys' nation, and 49 of the 50 states. 1943, post, the National Post Commander, Harry W. Cromley, writes the first draft of what will later become the Bill of Rights, GI Bill of Rights considered the Legion's single greatest legislation achievement. In June 22, 1944, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signs the law as the original GI Bill or Servicemen's Readjustment Act. January 1, 1890, 1880, I'm sorry, 1989, Veterans Administration is elevated to cabinet level status as the Department of Veterans Affairs. On November 11th, 2017, the Sun Squadron 1009 received their charter. And on July 30th, 2019, President Trump signs to let everyone get involved in opportunities for national service. And this allowed the American Legion to bring in all members from World War II on. Originally, during the cold years, the veterans who served were not allowed into the Legion. So that changed then. On behalf of uh, Yorktown Post 109, I'd like to thank the board for the recognition that they're giving us during this time. Um, we do a lot of things for the town as <laughs> two of you, three years, no. Um, we do the honor flags for burial. Mm -hmm. The sons do the uh, field of uh, Honor. Field of Honor uh, flags, yeah. which gets a little confusing, and the banners around town. So I want to just uh, thank everybody. We're 130, 28 strong in the post, um, and this is just a small grouping of who showed up tonight. Right. So again, thank you, 
Thank you, Matt, and uh, the entire board for the recognition. Uh, th thank you, Carl, Carl, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. Uh, what some people may not realize is Carl's actually a dual member. He's not only in the uh, American Legion, but he's also a veteran of foreign wars. And thank you for your service in Vietnam. And don't forget the Westchester County Veterans Association. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and the advisory board. And, and, and Carl, and Carl advisory board. I, I do hope that we see you. Uh, Councilman Diana runs a uh, a Vietnam. Uh, Memorial Day celebration at the Vietnam Memorial back by Lakeland High School. When? At, what is it, 9 a.m.? 9 a.m. on Memorial Day. Monday. Monday. Yep. So if you could make it, that would be right. fantastic. Uh, going on the honor flight this weekend and seeing the the response to of the Vietnam veterans as they got that that welcome home that they so well deserved is um, always uh, enjoy a very... Enjoy flight. Enjoy it. Yep. Hopefully Matt will be better by then. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> okay. yes, and and uh, just a, a quick question: If anyone wanted to join the American Legion, how do they do that? Very simple. Just contact us. They could go to our website. Uh, www.nylegion1009.org. Right on there. Oh wait, and we have to like you on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't get carried up. away like Matt, Mike does. Uh, yeah, they could do it that way, or just come by the post. Um, or call. And as I see, men or women that served yes. and served, yes. Linda yeah. is right, Linda. one Thank of you. three, three yeah. female members we have. Yep. And uh, is there anything you're doing for Memorial uh, Day weekend? Uh, we're allowing the VFW <laughs> this year to run the parade. Okay. And then there's hot dogs and hammer, uh, hot dogs and drinks at the VFW, and I believe as well as. What about over the weekend? Yes, the VFW and the Lions are doing it at the, at the post, but I was thinking of what you guys oh, are doing over oh, the weekend. Okay. All, right. All right. He's like coaching Friday, him. the 27th, John uh, McQuillan will have the Boy Scouts out replacing the flags on all deceased veterans' graves in the cemeteries around town. Beautiful. On Saturday, on Saturday we're doing poppy sales at uh, the Acme, the Chico's, the two Acme's, one in Trouble and in town, and the Chico's. Uh, there was a mix-up. We were supposed to be doing uh, Uncle G's, but uh, VFW is going to do it instead. And then Monday is the parade. And the poppies are? What do the poppies represent? Oh, you go back to World War One. Poppy field. So it's a memori It's in memoriam for those yes. who have served, right. and uh, and you could uh, get a poppy for a donation, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I th and I do believe you also do American flags too. Yes, we do. So you could uh, get some things to decorate your lawn. You can and show your patriotism. Yes, very good. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, Carl. Thank you guys. hopefully Thank you we'll see it. We'll see a couple of the sons. At you the will Bobby definitely Shales. see a couple of the sons. No, no we won't see you. You're. You're going to watch No, no, that was last weekend. Oh, that was last weekend. Yeah, so you'll see okay, me. Okay, so we'll see you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Carl. All right. Thank you. Wait, don't go anywhere yet, guys. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> Hold on. You, 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 have, you have to suffer through Paul Martin talking about the Suns, Carl. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I will ask uh, the, the chaplain of the Sons of the American Legion, Paul Martin, to step up to the uh, microphone and talk a little bit about the uh, Sons of the American Legion. And uh, this way, give an understanding of who can join and, and what it represents. Paul, you have four minutes. Thanks for the heads up there, <laughs> by the uh, way. Just, yeah, just I'm so well prepared. Not to interrupt you, Paul. Uh, we, we let Somers people talk in this room, so you're all set. <laughs> so um, I represent the Sons of the American Legion, which is an honor for me. Uh, the Sons of the American Legion was an organization that was founded by the American Legion around 1932 um, to allow uh, the sons and direct descendants of, at that time, primarily World War I veterans um, to be able to join an organization to pay tribute to their fathers. Um, so as it's gone on over the years, um, uh, direct descendants of any veteran who served in the armed forces can join the Sons of the American Legion and our mission is to support the American Legion and to support all veterans and all other veterans organizations within our community and throughout the country and um, I'm the proud son of a Korean War veteran my father who served and uh, 
I joined the Sons of the American Legion really to pay tribute to him, uh, to honor his service, and in doing so have the opportunity to um, help other veterans as well throughout the community and uh, throughout the country. So you can join the Sons of the American Legion if you are a direct descendant of a veteran. So it needs to be your father, grandfather, great-grandfather, etc., um, uncles um, and extended family members do not count, but it could be a paternal or a maternal grandfather or your father. So we're uh, a new, uh, as Carl said, a newly uh, chartered organization. We've only been in operation for about five years. Um, so we look for other young people uh, to be members if you are a direct descendant, and we'd be welcome to happy you. Uh, happy to welcome you into the American Legion family. So, Paul, as a son of a female service member, I would still be able to join, correct? Yes, I believe so. Okay, yes, I definitely believe. so. I believe so. Yeah, correct, Pat? It's a veteran. <laughs> Male or female veteran, yes. Correct, right. And, and what, uh, what type of uh, fundraising for veteran services are you doing right now? Well, I think our most uh, prominent... Um, Effort has been the military tribute banners that are being put up around town right now, and they go up on uh, from uh, before Memorial Day till after Veterans Day. You've probably noticed them. Um, we have about 60 of them approximately being hung this week, and we also have the Fields of Honor program um, that we've done. You can see the groupings of flags around town. There's five or six locations around town. And we have our monthly breakfast all you can eat <laughs> fundraiser, which is the second, third, third, third Sunday. <laughs> and you can visit our website and our Facebook page. But it's the third Sunday uh, of every month at the American Legion Hall from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. And it is open to the general public. So it is a fundraiser, so you're welcome to come with your families for a really wonderful home-cooked breakfast. I will not mention who the cook is at this time, but he's an outstanding, excellent cook. Thank you, and Paul. Have... <laughs> <laughs> it's Ed. All right. <laughs> and we have pancakes, hash browns, eggs, the whole nine yards. So it's a really great, great And that's fundraiser. what, sal1009.org? Sal... Uh, SalNewYork1009.org. Sal NY1009. Sal NY1009.org. There you go. Yes, and there's also a link off the American Legion. And and please like you on Facebook, right? Yes, like us on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Thank hey, the, uh, the 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 uh, field of honor flags. Would you give a little description of what they? actually stand for sure the, the thank you the, the, thank you paul the the field of honor flags are american flags to show patriotism you do not have to have uh they can be done in honor of whoever you'd like they do not need to be done uh in honor of a veteran so it is simply a, an american flag showing patriotism it's a hundred dollar donation uh which puts up the flag and then every year there's a 25 dollar uh Re retagging fees just so we could do flag replacements as unfortunately the wind in some of our spots rips them apart pretty quickly so uh, it's a great little program uh, we have currently uh, I want to say about 60 flags uh, paid for and tagged uh, and there were 13 done by the American Legion right in front of Railroad Park uh, that that were uh, done for the uh, soldiers that were killed in the last days of the Afghan war. So all 13 of them have a flag that's tagged right in front of the uh, railroad park uh, building, the, the old train station, the putt-putt station that was restored. So it's a great little program. If anyone's interested, once again, SAL 1009. Uh, you ha we have them, uh, a couple sites are sold out, but Railroad Park, Veterans uh, Field, Downing Park, Granite Knolls, and in front of the library. We uh, will be doing some, hopefully, at the mall. The people that we had the agreement with are no longer there, so we have to redo that. But uh, a, a great, great uh, uh, way to show your patriotism and also your respect for, for someone. Thanks, Tom. Go ahead. And can we, th okay. can, we, can we hear one more time for our American Legion and Sons of American Legion?
Thank you all for your service. Thank you, gentlemen. Stay well. You too, Pat. Thank you to all. Thank you to Councilman Lachterman uh, for recognizing, uh, helping recognize our American Legion and Sons of the American Legion, just two great organizations supporting our local veterans and their families, as well as our active military here in the town of Yorktown. Uh, next, we have a, a presentation by Alan Tissay about our audit report, which I want to thank Pat Caparell and our entire finance department for helping prepare. So, uh, Alan, Mark, if you and the team want to come on up and uh, share with us your findings. And, and Diana, can you, tip my, uh, can you tip your computer screen down just a hair so I can actually see everybody? Ah, there it is. Much better. Thank but you I'm so not much. Diana, but that's okay. That's, well, good enough. <laughs> Alan, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Slater. I hope you feel better. Feeling um, good. Good evening. We're going to present the 12-31-21 financial statements. And if everybody has a copy of the report, they could turn to the first page after the table of contents, which is the independent auditor's report. The format has changed slightly thanks to the AICPA. So the first paragraph is our opinion. And it's known as an, it's an unmodified opinion. It's also known as a clean opinion. It's the best opinion that you can receive. It means that everything within this financial statement is materially presented fairly. On pages four through 11 is management's discussion and analysis. It was prepared by your town controller. And basically it's an overview of the financial activities that occurred during the year. I'm not going to go through it, but it's very well written, and it does really give you a lot of information. On page 12 is the statement of net position, which is prepared on a full accrual basis, which means that all your liabilities, including your bonds, your other post-employment benefits, your compensated absences are all included in this report as opposed to the governmental funds. So if you look at page 12, on the second number up from the bottom, you'll see there's an unrestricted deficit of $39 million. That's directly a result of the other post-employment benefits, which is recorded on a full accrual basis. You have an actuary, and that liability is $96 million. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, this statement and the next page do not affect your governmental funds. It does not affect your budgeting or anything to do with any of the governmental funds. It's just, a bit, for the most part, it's informational. Mm -hmm. Okay? On page 13, as I mentioned, is the P&L, the profit and loss for the full accrual statement. It's the statement of activities. And the top portion of the page, you have your program revenues. And those are all the revenues that could be directly linked to a particular function or program listed on the left-hand side. Below that, you have all of your general revenues, which cannot be associated directly with a particular function or program. Now I'm going to turn to page 60, and I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to go through the general fund schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Hi, everyone. Um, so hi, Mark. As, oh, sorry. No, just said hi. Oh, no, yeah. Um, so as Alan was saying, this is the general fund for the town, which is the operating fund. This is what you pass your budget on. Um, so just starting with the left columns, your original budget, which was adopted um, for the fund. Then the next column to the right, your final budget, which is your original budget with a few budget adjustments that happened throughout the year where the numbers actually landed. And then the, that last column is a variance between what, what you actually spent and received versus their, your final budget. Um, so a few things I just wanted to point out in the revenues. Um, your adopted tax levy actually decreased slightly this Ooh. year in your adopted budget. Um, Mark, can you say that again? Because that's pretty <laughs> awesome. One more time for me. Just make me smile. I'm, I'm trapped in quarantine. The adopted budget, your property taxes actually slightly decreased in the current year in the budget. Um, Great job, everybody. The, your act, Great as, job, so your Pat. actual your actual property taxes increased slightly. If you look in that third column to thirteen point three million, about thirteen point one million last year. Um, 
But if you go to the total revenue line, you can see that you actually received $32 million, a little over $32 million this year, which was a positive variance of about $3.6 million to the final budget. Um, the $32 million in revenue was an increase from last year of about $3.5 million. Um, the reason these variances arise is because as a board, you, you budget, as we would recommend, you budget more conservatively because revenues are revenues. You don't have much control over things such as if you look three lines down, your non-property taxes, you had a, a, a positive... Um, variance to the budget of about 2.6 million. That's your, your, your sales tax from the county. Um, obviously, you don't dictate that. Um, so the conservative budget, positive budget variance. If you look down in your state aid, you also had a positive um, budget variance of about 1.5 million. What makes up that is basically your mortgage tax was much higher this year. Um, and came in came in well over budget. The next grouping is the expenditures for the town. Um, in total, the expenditures increased about two point one million dollars, up about eight percent. Um, but that's what you would expect um, with increases in payroll, increases in medical expenses, increase in in some of the rates. Um, but if you look at the variance column you did $3.3 million better than budget. Mm -hmm. um, so going down, your Sorry, excess... Mark you, you cut out, Mark, you cut out of my side. Say that one again. Um, <laughs> you had a positive budget variance of $3.3 million in your expenditures. Mm -hmm. Okay. You spent 3.3 less than you had budgeted. Um, 3.3 less than we budgeted. All right. right. All right. So the next line is your excess of revenues over expenditures, you had a total um, positive budget variance of 6.8 million. Um, and then going down, if you go across three lines from the bottom, the net change in fund balance, um, you could see that $6.8 million positive budget variance. If you look at your actual amounts, you had a $2.8 million increase to your fund balance. Um, so if you look at that first column, your original budget, that $1 million, so if you received everything and expended everything that you put into your original budget, you had planned to spend $1.1 million. You adjusted that to a final budget of planning to spend $4 million, and then your actual came in a positive $2.8 million, making the variance six a positive $6.9 million for the town. So at the beginning of the year, you started with $23.2 million in fund balance. You ended at 26, a little over $26 million in fund balance for the town in the general fund. Um, so that's the, the revenue and expenditures. If you flip to the page before, page 59, it's the balance sheet. Um, just a few things I wanted to point out here. In your liabilities, the unearned revenue, that $1,861,000 that is new this year, that's your, your ARPA money. Um, it's sitting in a liability now because you received the money but haven't used it. So it sits on the balance sheet until it's used. When it's used, it'll, it'll move to revenue. Um, and then the bottom part has your fund balance. So the fund balance is broken out into buckets. Your non-spendable, restricted, assigned, unassigned. Your non-spendable of 773, that's your prepaid expenses. Your restricted fund balance um, is for employee benefits. Your assigned fund balance, that two million is made up of encumbrances, um, a tax cert restriction, and also you used $925,000 of next year's budget to budget to, to budget this year to um, and then you have unassigned, which is money that has no restriction on it of $22.3 million in the, in the general fund. And the breakout of all the funds, fund balance, I'm not going to go through it, but that's on page 53. Um, 
that'll show you all the funds, including what I just went through in the general fund, and break out exactly what those those buckets are for. Um, that's the general fund. So just just to touch real quickly on some of the other funds, your highway fund, your highway department. If you go to page 69 and 70, you can see the P&L for your highway fund for page 69 is this year, page 70 is last year as a comparison. Um, just to point out, the increase in fund balance in the highway fund this year is 520,000. Last year, you, it increased about 506,000. So you started the year at 2.1 million in the highway fund and ended the year at a little less than 2.7 million. Um, and the levy was reduced, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then the, the last thing I wanted to point out was page 73 and 74 breaks out your special district funds. And I just wanted to point out um, the net change in fund balance in all of those funds were, were surpluses. Um, three lines from the bottom, you can see how much each of those funds fund balance increased in the current year. Um, other than that, I don't, um, if there's. Overall, the town did very well. You rebounded very well from COVID pandemic. Um, you're in a good financial position. And I would just like to thank Pat and her uh, team. The audit went very well. There were no issues. And uh, as I said, we issued a clean opinion. And uh, the town should be very proud because you still have maintained your AAA rating. Right. Thank Great. you. Great. Everything thank was you, good, and um, we're happy to be here. <laughs> thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Well, he's a little good news. Ellen and Mark, thank you. Big round of applause for Pat Capra on the finance department. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We usually say to Pat, show us the money, and she won't. <laughs> <laughs> So it's always a good thing when your auditors come in with good news. So that's, that's fantastic. Uh, all right, next Toll we're going to go to Toll Brothers. Uh, we have with us David Cooper and his team. Uh, and this is in regards to the proposal on Catherine Street next to the field zone. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Supervisor. Hope you're feeling well and, and members of the board. Uh, for the record, uh, David Cooper, partner with the law firm of Zarin and Steinmetz. Let me just say those are very two, two tough acts to follow. So uh, we're hopefully we're bringing you some good news as well. But uh, good to see you tonight. Um, with me is uh, Jack Lanham and, and Kevney Moses from, from Toll Brothers, as well as Joe Rena from Site Design Consultants, the, the project engineer. We're going to set it up. But Joe. <laughs> Joe's busy tonight. He's got um, while we're while we're putting the, the plans on on the screen, let me just just uh, set it up. So so Toll Brothers is the contract vendee to purchase uh, a portion of the field home, uh, Holy Comforter property. Um, specifically, uh, to, uh, the vision is to purchase about a 53 acre portion of, of the property that that's currently undeveloped, except for the the field home building, which which would remain. Um, the proposal is to rede uh, redevelop that site with uh, an 118 unit active adult townhome community um, that would include the preservation of the the townhome built at uh, the townhome building the, the field home building uh, which I want to we really want to talk to the town board about tonight um, but we're here to, to update the town board on the progress with, with the project because we, we anticipate in the next couple of, of uh, weeks submitting a formal uh, zoning petition to rezone this portion of the site in furtherance of a proposed subdivision and site plan uh, proposal um, so uh, a couple of things we want to we want to cover tonight. We'll hopefully uh, um, uh, cover it in the, in the time allotted. Uh, one is the revised concept plan. You, you may remember we were before you, I think, back in October of 2021, with a, a similar proposal that was 136 units. Um, and as as the progress into, into discussions about the the site and more investigation in the site uh, progressed. Uh, the, the, the density has been reduced to 118 units. Um, so we want to take you through through that plan. Um, one of the, the main issues we want to, want to talk about is the, um, uh, uh, the approach to the preservation of, of the field home building itself, the historic building. Um, Toll Brothers wants to preserve that and understands that the town also wants to see it preserved. Yeah. Um, the issue for Toll Brothers is, is they've, they've really investigated trying to incorporate the reuse of that 
that structure into the community, maybe as a clubhouse, et cetera, it's really not feasible. So what we're, what we're seeking to do is subdivide out that parcel and give it back uh, to the town. And give it back to the town. Um, what, what Toll is also proposing to do is, is provide a, uh, a maintenance uh, fund to, to fund maintenance for about three or three years to or like so. To like boost what it is, right? Right, right. and, and yeah. so that the town can, it takes it over. It's it's at hopefully a very low cost. And why you why the town figures out what to do with it next. Um, we think that's the best approach. We feel that about $150,000 would, would, would allow you to maintain that building for through a, a three-year period or so. Um, but rather than, than demolishing it or, or trying, to, trying to adaptively reuse it in a way that really isn't appropriate for it, we felt that, that carving it out uh, would work best. Um, in addition to that, um, we, we have been in discussions with, with the, the Parks and Recreational Department about the loss of the soccer field. There's a soccer field currently uh, in, in the, in, on the site um, that would be replaced with, with, with the development for stormwater management and, and some, some units. Um, what we've discussed is, is paying uh, in, into a, a, a fee in lieu of $100,000 to help uh, the Recreational Department go through uh, or fund some, some programs that it or, or projects that it wants to undertake in the next couple of, couple of months or years. Um, and then also answer any questions that, that the board may have about, about moving forward. So before I turn it over to Joe, the, the, the one thing from the zoning uh, attorney's perspective is I just want to, want to make sure that the town board is comfortable with, with the approach that we believe works best for, for, for this project. Um, again, the proposal would be to, to subdivide the property into, into a 50.51 acre portion of the site for mm -hmm. the development and then, and then the, the, the townhome. Rezone it to what we believe that would, the most appropriate zone would be the RSP2, um, and then and then a site plan approval to build those 118 units. Um, as I said, Joe, we'll take you through the development plan in, in a minute. Um, the, the site is currently zoned in the R, it's a split zone. It's currently RSP3 and uh, R140. Um, neither of those, those zones really would, would accommodate the, the use that we're proposing. Um, we did look into uh, other, other uh, um, zones like uh, uh, RSP1, uh, but in consultation with, with John Tegeter and, and, and your planning staff and, and, and the uh, members of the board, uh, we've arrived at thinking that the RSP2 is, is the best zone to, uh, to use to, to accommodate this type of... Yeah. Can, can you explain for those listening the difference between RSP1 and RSP2? Sure. So, so an RSP1 um, is a, um, well, I just said the, the existing zoning, the RSP3 is, is a geriatric community. Um, and that, that's not what, you know, like an assisted well, living. Active. Right, right. And that's not an active ad adult yeah. community. Um, the RSP1, while it would allow this type of, 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 of age restricted use, is really more of a, of a neighborhood commercial mixed use uh, a zone. Um, and so the RSP2, which is senior citizen uh, development, we think is, is the right approach to, to really bringing a, a, a good use to the to this site. Um, the site was a re, uh, uh, several years back rezoned and, and, and there was a contemplated uh, residential development uh, for the, the site, but that's no longer no longer in, in play. And so this is, we think, still can bring a, a productive use to this property at, at, a, at a nice density and at the right use for active adult. Uh, and from reviewing it in the RSP2, the number of proposed units can be held, right, Joe? Right. That's, that's, he's shaking his head, yes. Yeah. Just, <laughs> he's very uh, excited to answer me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, 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 I mean, look, we don't have to, don't have to decide it tonight, but, but as long as, as the town board feels that that's, that's a comfortable way to, to, to start out the process, that's what our thought is, is to, to provide a, a petition in the forth, in forthcoming weeks to, for an RSP2. But, okay. okay, well... Uh, with, with, without much more ado, let me turn it over to Joe just to take you through the actual the, the concept development plan, uh, and then I'll return to talk about the uh, the town home and uh, the field home and uh, the soccer field. Okay, I'm gonna try to manage this here. I know this. <laughs> Is that here's the question? Is that soccer field in use? Like, do kids use it or utilize it? Yeah. For, for who? For you, you guys, can, if you could step up to the mic, well, sorry, so the people at home could hear. Uh, Kevin Moses with Toll Brothers. I, I believe uh, after conversations with Jim, they use it as a practice field for youth soccer. Yeah. That's my understanding. That's correct. Thank you. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Thanks, Joe. Joe. Um, so, so to put bring you into where the uh, the site is located, it's this yellow shaded area, which is approximately 50 acres. Um, it's on the north, the north part of what, what what is or what will was the field home property. The location of the field hall is right here. Let me zoom in a little closer there. So you can see here across is Glassberry Court. Uh, this is the nursing facility, mm -hmm. only the Holy Comforter. Here's the field hall is right here. Mm -hmm. And this is all the open area <clears throat> that's to the north of that up to the aqueduct, which is runs along this side of the property right here. Uh, this is the soccer field that we're, we've been talking about. <coughs> and we're keeping the soccer field, we're restoring the soccer field and leaving it there, correct? No, we're not. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come up and, and dump that. Okay. Oh, sorry. Anytime you guys got to come up, you got to come up to the mic. Yeah, right. yeah. uh, again, this is an aerial view, a bird's eye view of the property. Uh, <coughs> This is the assisted living facility. This is the nursing facility here. There's the field hall up in the uh, far distance to the north and Glassbury Court across the street. Again, another perspective of that. Here's the field hall. Uh, the proposed entrance to the uh, development will be just north of the north, north entrance of the field hall. It's located here and there'll be a secondary entrance and you'll see that on the plan shortly how it loops around to that location there which is further to the north so the development this is the main entry to the development which is again <coughs> just west of the field hall building um, there's 118 units attached townhouse style units uh, as you enter the site you see there's a, um, a a split entryway and exit way here as you enter the site, the road loops to either the right or left. Directly in front of you will be the recreation center, uh, which will, uh, will have a recreation building, other amenities, as well as a pool. And as you make way through the site, you'll end up coming out further north. Again, uh, these are all townhouse style, attached town, townhouse style units. Uh, the area in green is a wetland, which has been delineated and uh, surveyed so this is an accurate a fairly accurate location for the uh, wetland that's on the property and buffer area uh, off to the north you see two areas where we're proposing some stormwater management basins those will uh, handle most of the stormwater generated from the project the uh, project will be served by public water and public sewer of course and um, <coughs> That is available right on the property. There's a sewer main on the property, which will be updated. Located. Yeah. Yes, it's on the property currently. Hey Joe, is the entrance off of the main street um, where the where the pillars are now, where they built a uh, uh, you know I think it's got a chain across two two nice stone pillars. Is that approximately where the entrance is going to be? No, that's a little further down. A little further down. Okay. Yeah. yeah that. I believe those pillars are more, I think they're below the soccer field, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, all right. All right. So I think that's further down, closer to the aqueduct. Okay. okay. <coughs> I've seen that, right? Um, yeah. on Catherine's There'll be a series of retaining walls on the site to, you know, as the site generally slopes uh, to the northeast, there's gonna be some retaining walls to make up the, the elevation difference. Um, the uh, to work with the, to work with the grades, all the great all the all the proposed roadways and whatnot will meet the necessary standards as far as slope, width, emergency access, etc. And they will be able to be handled by the town, the roads. These will this will be are a, they private? This will be a private right. right. Okay. Um, I think that covers all the main the main uh, uh, points of the development. Anything else you want to 
Joe, could you flip back to the... Uh, uh, go ahead, get up. I just wanted to take a look at the architectural of it again. Back to see the, the architecture? Yeah. Okay. So these are these are um, <coughs> typical Toll Toll Brothers yeah. develop, you know, mm -hmm. style developments that um, mm -hmm. that they built in the area, um, and they'll either mimic this or this will be the exact style. I'll let Kevin speak a little more towards that. I forgot to mention thank you for your time tonight. Um, <laughs> appreciate you guys uh, giving us a few minutes. Um, so these would be representative of the architecture. I can't say that these would be exact by any stretch of the imagination, but I think it's a good representative um, composition of, of, of what the architecture might look like on site. I'm not sure if I missed it, but the ta I'm not sure if I missed it. The townhomes will be approximately what size? In square 30, footage? 32 to 34 feet wide and approximately 70 feet deep. Uh, how much square footage is that? Like, you know, limited? between 2,300 and 2,600 square feet okay. approximately. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you know that Toll Brother does a quality job uh, with everything they do. I mean, you could drive over to Valeria, which is not that far My away. My family lives in your development in Armagh. It's been there a long time. The house hasn't fallen. <laughs> well, that's good. I've aged, but the house that, hasn't aged. That's, that's <laughs> sort of a low bar. Oh, the house gosh. hasn't fallen. <laughs> now, the work is great. I guess I just want to understand, really. Um, I know that there's a field on there, so I didn't know what we're doing about moving the field. I know that we have a sub... We have the sewer sub pump there that definitely needs a facelift, if not a flushing, to manage all of those homes. I know that for sure. So just to address that, we are, we are conducting a study right now to determine if there's any infiltration into the sewer system on site. Yeah. Um, we've set up flow monitors. and Thank um, you, because you're going to need it. <laughs> yeah, basically to see if there's any uh, uh, stormwater or uh, groundwater that's being put into the system that shouldn't be. Inflow. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're working on that right now. Uh, we should be completing that study within the next month or two. And uh, we'll have results. We've, we've been coordinating that with Dan, uh, so he's aware of, uh, of what we're doing with that. And that about the historical house, I had, you know, I had read the notes on that, and I, I understood that. And I understand how it doesn't really fit the model, and, and you're gifting it back, essentially, with, right. with a little bit of a support system with some help with, right, yeah exactly. until we figure out <laughs> if we're going to turn it into something so yeah. so all right so let me let me address the um this the field first because uh, i was going to get you know your time is big on their field yeah, just, sure. you know we're I, not trying to eliminate uh, i i know I, I i live i live in lewisboro and you guys always oh. uh, beat our teams because you, oh, you have much better practice yeah. uh, field <laughs> um but the so the the field itself <laughs> this field is, is not going is not going to be able to, to survive the, the development because there's just not enough room to, to right. keep it um, so we've been working with, with the, the rec department on uh, in lieu, an in lieu uh, uh, contribution. So Great. like $100,000 towards, towards whatever, whatever the rec department needs um, rather than, than building a field in, you know, in, in lieu. So, okay. Um, so that would be that, that money the, will go to other fields. Right. So right. that's, you know, the so. field money stays in fields here. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so, yes, with, with respect to the, to the field home, right, we, 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 we agree that, that preserving that building is, is important. Um, but it do, it just doesn't incorporate well into into the. No, I agree. So. I totally understand. <laughs> so the proposal would be to subdivide it out as, as long as the town is comfortable with with them. We would convey it over to the town, you know, for ten dollars or whatever, whatever mm -hmm. is required, um, along with the right, mm -hmm. along with the with the contribution towards the the maintenance, so that um, we have time to RFP it or to figure out what we're going to do with it. Yeah. yeah, I really I respect that. Yeah. So we just want to make sure that the, that the, the board is comfortable with that with that approach before. Well, how much property would would come with that? I mean, yeah, you'd have to give it some some amount of land. Oh yeah, it has. Right. Um, yeah, it's about, yeah, it's, it's like about a two little point, under three acres, right? Uh, two point seven acres, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. The, the um, our our thinking at this point is so so a municipal use is not permitted in the mm -mm. OSB two. So the thought would be to, to rezone that to the, to the R140. To see what can happen. Uh, right, because that, that permits municipal uses. Now, and it's also the minimum is, is I think it's a two-acre minimum, so it would meet at least the site, the, um, the size. There may be some variances that we would require because of setbacks, um, but I'm not sure that you'd be able to, to, to meet any, any setback the way that the, the, this lot would be created. But as long as we're preserving the, that building and allowing the future use, we, we think that will still... Work. We have a very active um, 
like you know a, a, an active senior amount of seniors and I know that a lot of them are downsizing mm -hmm. so my concern is have you done some work on discussing like you know do they want a 3,000 square foot townhouse or is this a cab thing, is this is, a thing? Oh, yes yeah I totally have well, we know, I'm just saying I just no I feel like we have a lot of active yeah. seniors <laughs> in our community I was just stating um, we have a lot of active seniors in our community and a, a lot of them want to spend their time outside of the home and not have so much maintenance um, so I understand for zoning purposes, I understand for setup purposes, I think they're beautiful and whatnot, but my question to you is, um, have you, you know, spoken to our community and communities nearby that would want to move into a 3,000 square foot townhouse? When they are selling these beautiful homes here, you know, no, I'm just saying, we, you know, we have a lot of seniors that are selling 3,000 square foot homes with pools and whatnot hoping that a young family will come in just because they don't want to deal with the maintenance. You know, you fix the roof, then you got to fix the window, they don't, don't want to deal with it anymore. They'd rather go hiking or use the trails that, you know, Susan now has beautiful maps on them, they can get around, everything's great. So I just, I wonder, because I know, I know friends of mine in their 40s that would buy a townhouse of that as well, so. Sure, so I think we've had um, experience with similar communities um, and this type of product, I think, um, is welcomed by the demographic we're trying to target being age oriented um i think the floor plans also set up well and that they're mastered down which mm -hmm. is very important for people i think over you know 55 and older i have a ranch so go gentle i like my ranch <laughs> <laughs> but um you know the, the homes are actually you know while 2300 to 2600 sounds big they're fairly modest and pretty efficient okay um in their design and um Again, we've seen the demographics of 55 and older really get excited about this type of layout. So. Okay, so it's the layout that's really going to sell. The, the open, probably an open floor plan, more mobility, less little pocket rooms, things of that sort. Yes, exactly. Okay. More of an open floor plan as well. But, uh, you know, also people in the 55 and older demographics still have kids and families that come back to visit and having that... You know, Extra room is always helpful. Exactly. Yep. The, go, um, go ahead, sir. No, yeah, you go. The, uh, so it's going to kind of mimic... I use the word mimic, uh, uh, Glassberry, um, the one up the street and across, that those those townhouses, condos. Yes. J yeah. Jack has a lot more experience with that oh, community okay. than I do. Yes. Yes. You got to yes from the back of the room. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to put that out there because we are looking for homes for our active seniors, and I do want them, you know. So uh, I'm, I got to be honest, I'm hung up on the soccer field, you know. I'm you know, the kids here are very important. Um, they're very important to me, and uh, we have a big soccer community. Um, how big is that field? Do you know? You know, I don't know offhand. Jim is here, too, um, if you want to just I have a feeling it, it's somewhat proximate to your standard soccer field size. Um, I, I will say we've had, you know, several conversations with Jim over at Parks and Rec, and he's been very supportive of the plan to date. Not, not only the plan, but, but the project at large. He thinks it would be a great asset for the community. Um, but... Um, he's also in support of um, this approach of the kind of fee in lieu, if you will. And by no means are we trying to take recreational amenities away from the town. Well, no, I know that, and I, I know you. I know you wouldn't intend to do that, and I, sure. I, I know your intentions are genuine. I get, I get that, and I'm not saying anything otherwise. But sure. um, you know, fields are very important. Fields are very hard to come by. Fields are very hard to uh, book. Sure. <laughs> There's so many. Um, issues that occur in all our clubs because it's just not enough you know i mean if you could go 24 7 yeah right yeah you got plenty of field time right but field time is very hard to come by especially with um you know we're a family-oriented town um and and that's what we do here so understood well we're absolutely open to continuing the dialogue with jim and and obviously yourselves as, I think as a board he's here, as well if but. you want to bring him up just to talk about the pocket park is jim in the back there Oh, he left? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we know it's a pocket park, and there's, like, it's a pocket field, and it's not as accessible as most fields are, so. And Jim had also mentioned that there was some real challenges with that site as far as parking uh, as well. Oh, yeah, because of, there's no parking. Exactly. <laughs> there is no parking, so. Um, yeah. No, I understand that. Well, I'm sorry that Jim can't be here. To... But um, noted, sir, and, and happy to continue the dialogue. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, good news is, is we're just preparing the petition, so this is just the start of, of, of the conversation. But um, before before putting final pen to paper, we wanted to make sure you guys were all comfortable with it. So. Um, that that's 
essentially all I ha we have for the update tonight. I mean, we'll, we'll be back before you, hopefully in the next couple couple of months with, with a full-blown petition, et cetera. Um, but happy to answer any of the questions you guys have and, and you know. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to see the development. I think, um, you know, I think the seniors do need um, a place. Uh, um, it's kind of a little out of the way, um, I think, for, um, it, it, would, it, would, it would require some driving, which, which I don't think is a big deal. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 look, I'm, I love the architecture. I think it'll really, uh, it, it's, it's really nice looking and modern, and, um, and we do need to expand our housing stock. So I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the project and, and how it develops. And Sergio, we're not, yes. that, we're not that far from 55, so this is good. Right? We're not that far. I don't know. I'm not sure I want to right. do that. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're not jumping into that in the petition. <laughs> it's a nice size project. Yeah. You know, uh, for that particular piece of property. Um, Joe Rena, that's wet, uh, a wetland or wetland buffer towards the uh, left, uh, right be. side of the uh, the map. Is mm -hmm. that what you said? Correct. So that's, okay. <clears throat> that's wetland. Um, it's actually the cross hatch there. You could see. It's a different shade here. <coughs> yep. That's the wetland. And then um, the buffer line here, a portion of the road extend into the buffer, just this whole portion here. Uh, but the rest of the project is outside the buffer. Okay. And it's a local wetland. It's, it's, a, it's not a DEC wetland. It's a town wetland. Right. And, of course, um, this, is, this project is going to have to go through all the scrutiny, the DEP, et cetera, um, from the stormwater perspective. Yeah. Um, and Tell as far Jim. as the Jim is here if you want Okay. To. Um, and as far as um, the architecture and so forth, they, they, they're, I've seen a lot of Toll Brothers stuff, and they do do nice architectural, <coughs> excuse me, design. Um, and like I said, this may not be 100%, but this is kind of the format that Toll Brothers uses, correct, on, on, on these lines. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, our, our Parks and Rec uh, superintendent, just came in, Jim. We we're just uh, Sergio had a uh, couple questions about the elimination of the soccer field. Yes. Um, yeah, I was watching uh, on my phone. Um, so your, your question was whether it's being used. Yeah, uh, I was one of them. Y YYSC uh, uses it quite often. Uh, it's a great practice field. Uh, not quite big enough for games, but they do use it for practice a lot. And and so if that would were to not be there one day, yeah. where would they practice? It'd be hard to find them the time that they need. Right. Uh, no, I know. I know. I know the answer. You know, I just. Uh, yeah. That that and that's one of my concerns. Um, one of the and not just that group, yeah. but you know, uh, the soccer people in general. You know, the soccer. And, and, and a little com conversation we had was maybe using the money to help Hunter Brookfield become more playable. Um, yeah, Hunter Brook is a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So th it, they could, could use help. Use that could use a facelift, and, and possibly if we can make that place more playable, uh, that might help a little bit. All right. But the, the grass is much softer uh, over at the field that they'll be getting rid of, unfortunately. Then Hunterbrook, it's softer than the field? The, the field. Uh, Hunterbrook's very rough, and that's part of the problem with Hunterbrook. It's uh, very, very rocky, uh, and it sits in the sun a lot. So, really you know, we talked about potentially turfing it one day, uh, which would be nice. Um, Obviously, that costs money. How much money would it cost to turf it? <laughs> uh, probably. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> like Mets money. We don't have Mets so money. Like a half million. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hey. It'd be close to half a million, 400,000. <laughs> Depends on, on, on what, what, we're, what we're turfing exactly. Mm -hmm. Just the upper field would probably be around 400. If we're talking about the whole thing, including the baseball, it would probably be like a million. Um, so it depends on what scope of the project you'd want to do. Uh, but that would certainly help up there, especially the top field. Okay. So we, we can certainly get a quote on that as well, if you'd like more details on that. Uh, we are starting conversations uh, with the legacy, because that field's about due in two or three years. So within that conversation, we could oh, ask also ask to, for a quote. For, can we fill uh, in retention ponds, Joe? No, that's a no good. No, no not, that's for nothing good can well. come of that, right? Not when anybody's <laughs> looking. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? If we can ask for Hunter Brook as well to have, to have them quote us on that. Is that something you'd like? Well, so we're, we're taking away a soccer field. Yes, correct. Right? Uh, even though it's practice. Yep. So I would, I would <coughs> keep the conversation to the soccer portion of Hunter Brook. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah. All right. 
I don't have any other questions. Anybody else have questions on uh, the Catherine Street field? Has anyone spoken to the YYSC about losing that practice field? Uh, I have spoke to them briefly. They're not happy about it, uh, but they, they understand uh, this project, but they, they were not pleased. And so, I'm sorry, I'm just having a hard time understanding. So, but the, the solution right now is to move them to Hunterbrook. Is that what I heard? No. That would be once they already use Hunterbrook, but we try and make the upper field, which is not very playable at the moment, uh, better. And we try to give that a facelift. That, that is that be, what the is that what the proposal is from the department to utilize the hundred thousand dollars for? That's what I would propose it for. Yes, I mean the, the, the conversation we had was to maybe have Toll Brothers come in and help uh, help help develop that because um, they probably do a great job developing, but they they didn't really have an appetite to do that. I just want to echo Councilman Esposito. I agree that we need to be very considerate of of the of the loss of fields because I hear it all the time from people who are trying to get on all of our fields here in town and there's just there's not, not enough time in a day so i think i think that's a conversation that we may want to dig deeper into that's, that's fine let me just yeah. just one, one thing i just want to make make clear um i think toll brothers help would, would be financial and the building the field or, or, or construction is, is not um in their ballywick but um so just as we're having this conversation just realize yeah. the distinction between for offering, yeah. That's how I understood. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, they they pour concrete. They don't turn dirt. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> well, I mean, I grew up in the Bronx. The fields were concrete. <laughs> Jim, Jim, have you have you estimated, Jim? Has, can anyone ask if Jimmy's estimated how much it would cost to make Hunterbrook playable on like a on like a menu? So if you wanted to turf it, if you wanted to just make it playable, what the different options were there? So we know what the cost is. Uh, th that, was, that question was asked before. It was just a guesstimate on my point. Uh, I think it'd be around four hundred to a half million to turf it. Uh, well, I heard that, but so we don't have a firm estimate no, on the didn't. different options that that may be at our disposal. Uh, so maybe I, that maybe that's something that we can we can get to give to Toll to see if that's something that they can help us with more. C certainly, uh, we we'd certainly have to price that out and see what what exactly we'd be putting in there. Uh, a fence is definitely needed for that upper field. Uh, and we definitely have to put soil down throughout the whole field, and that's acres uh, of, of soil. So that, that would have certainly a cost, and you'd have to high proceed, et cetera. Well, they, I, they I just want to make sure that, that we're not, and, and I mean this is no, no disrespect to Toll Brothers, and, and I'm very pleased with, with the proposal, but I just I don't want it to, I don't, I don't want it to take $100,000, and then we've got a $400,000 project. I think we should know that beforehand what we're getting ourselves into. Mm -hmm. Understood. And, and I would imagine they'll have soil either coming or going, so we would be you able to. You when they dig? Mm -hmm. Well, they might have to br bring in. Mm -hmm. They may have to bring in. They'll be tested. Okay. Too. Yep. Yep. All right, well, then we'll, we'll be back to you. We'll keep the All dialogue right. going. Great. We're looking forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, John. Will you? All right, next. We, why, don't, uh, uh, Luciano, why don't you introduce the next go out and botch up the name of the organization? Yeah, okay. I'm going to introduce the Piace Italian American presentation. Let's get Josephine yeah. Biondi, um, Michael Di Costanza, Ralph Gaiazzo, um, Kevin Faga for regarding the San Gennaro feast. How you doing, everybody? Hello, Mike. Hi. Luciana, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Mike. This is Kevin. That's Josephine. That's Ralph. I gotta bring you down for a minute. I can't hear him. I gotta bring you down for a minute. No, I just can't hear Mike, so no problem. I'll try to keep this close. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you a little bit better, Mike. Thanks. Sorry. Pull that yeah. mic close to you. Mike, pull the mic close. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're gonna do the San Gennaro Festival. A mic? How you doing? Uh, it'll be the 14th through the 18th of September. Okay. Mike, can you? Hey guys, Mike, in the you, back, can do we have the conversation outside? Hold on one second. Can we take the conversation outside? So, Mike, you're here to present the San Gennaro feast. Yes. The reboot. The rebirth. So, yeah, of the, yeah. yeah. Good deal. Mike. Mike, can you explain your 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 previous role in San Gennaro? Yeah, I was uh, an officer. Ralph was an officer. Uh, we uh, 
we resigned from that and we joined another organization that uh, supports Italian heritage. It supports uh, Italian music, uh, entertainment. So that's the new organization that'll be throwing uh, San Gennaro. You have to excuse me, I'm in a bad COVID day today. Uh-huh. It's, it's because of the pollen. But, uh, yeah, so that's about what we're going to have. Everything will be the same, the same entertainment. Are you, you getting um, San Gennaro from the same church? Yes. Okay. Yes, that comes from Mulberry Street. Yeah. Yes, that's the, one of the original statutes. Yeah, well, my family is originally from Mulberry Street. Ralph's family is originally from Mulberry Street. So that was their church. That's the church that they went to. They saved their nickels and dimes to give to the church to bring that statue over. So we go back all the way into, you know, from the 1900, early 1900s to go into that, uh, to that church. So it's special to us, the feast, you know. When we go down, I mean, if you go into the church, you see uh, the name of my family, uh, all the weddings, all the communions from Ralph's family were held there. And it's, 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 it's a, you should actually see the church. It's a beautiful church. So but, you were responsible for bringing the statue up? Yes. We all were. Ralph was. Right, yeah, right. No, no I understand. And the, the statue goes back uh, It to goes the back into the shrine. Yes, when we bring it back, it goes into a shrine where it has its own shrine. Yeah, like a shot. Yeah. No, no, I know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, CCM is what hosted San Gennaro before. This is a this is a whole new yeah a whole new organization. So Mike, you actually you actually formally resigned with I Ralph. I resigned and Ralph resigned from CCM. From CCM. And did you guys have an affiliate? Maybe somebody who else you knew that was part of La Presunzione, like there at the Saint Gennaro down on Mulberry Street that introduced you to T Piace. How did you find T Piace? Oh, T Piace is actually performers that perform uh, uh, Trey Bella and Louis Venaria. They actually perform at our feast, and they had an organization where they go around performing. So, they oh, so act- you actually added the this feast yes. to another yes. grouping yes. that also we, has. We, we joined. We joined their organization. Right, and how much have you been to their venues and their your their events? So this, yes. in other words, yes. what I'm saying is, yes. hold on, let me let me go back. Di Piace Italian is an Italian-American organization yes. that promotes the culture. Yes. You guys sat there and said, I got they, this they great... Do, they do feasts all around the country. Right, and you said, play. I got this great feast in Yorktown. Yes. I bring well, up they the play city. here. I, I, I know, but yeah. they like the feast. Yeah. Would you guys want to take on the feast? Yes. We can be the directors of it or whatnot, yes. and you would be under their insurances and all of their... Yes. Okay. We're, we're actually, we're becoming officers. We're just waiting for the paperwork, and then we're going to be focuses on that. Okay, so that's how that evolved. It wasn't. It was there was a need for a new organization, a more yes. reputable organization. Yes, you wanted to come in strong with another group that also had the same Italian American beliefs. You know, bringing back San Gennaro, You know, all of that wonderful stuff. And this is what this is what you're presenting. So what you're presenting is to the board to for our blessing for nine fourteen through nine eighteen. Yes. Taxes. This organization is is all up to date. The new organization. Yeah. Yeah, the new organization is all up to date. I mean, I can give you whatever paperwork you want from the new organization. Yeah, I'll get yeah I'll get all that for you. That's not a problem. And my, Mike, how are the charities set up? That, that the, the, I assume it's a 501c3 again? It's a 501c3. And, yeah. and the money is distributed to charities? And it's distributed to charity and also the church. Okay. We donate and to the church. How, how do you work that percentage-wise, and what are the charities? How are they picked? Well, this time around, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pick different charities. There was, there was too many, we were all over the place. 
So this year, this time around, we're going to do the church and then a local charity. Okay. So this way it's a local charity, and, and we give to the church who lets us take the statue. So this way, you know, and then we're going to just pick one. Instead of having 20 different small checks, we can just give one that really, really needs it. A larger check. So when you say the church, the church on Mulberry. Yeah, Mulberry. Yeah. Most precious blood. So nothing for the churches up here, per se. Well, we give them, we give them, uh, we give them, st- you know, uh, vending spots to, to raise money. Okay. Yeah. So you gift the church the vending spots yes. because yes. it is a Catholic. And, and and we also give them where they use where they do the the, the Zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. It's a big. It's a big deal. Yeah, that's a big deal for them. <laughs> Very big deal. Yeah. Very so big. I know St. Pat's does a Zeppelin. Is there any representation from uh, Elizabeth Seton? No, not really. I mean, they're welcome to do whatever they want, you know, whatever they feel like they, they want to do, you know. But but they they support us, you know, they, they come up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, as officers in CCM now moving over, what 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 is the the backbone for your uh for your organization, how, you know, putting together the the feast, you know, bringing in the vendors, uh, vendors, uh, entertainment, uh, setting set up. So, so who handled that beforehand? Was it a gr- was it the whole group? Was it individuals? Uh, it was a group. It was a group effort. Group effort. Yeah. Is it going to be the same vendors basically that were here the last time? Or uh, of a most the, 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 there's some new ones coming. Yeah, there's some new ones. Coming. And if we know of any wonderful vendors that might reach out to us, do sure. we just connect sure. them to you? Is that because yes. we've got a lot we of beautiful a small businesses here that because of COVID, so we have some new ones coming. Yeah. All right. Well, that happens. Well, yeah. that's dynamic anyway. I mean, you don't you 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 could have it's a yearly thing. So I mean, yeah. there's people available. There isn't new people come in, new businesses open. So I mean. Yeah. Um, you know, so I know how that goes. And as of right now, is it only you and Ralph that went over to TPJ from the old group at CCM? Uh, yes. yes, yes. There was only three of us back then. So we resigned, and then we went over. So there's three of us now. There's actually on, on the new board, there'll be five. And they herald from where? Uh, uh, Manhattan. From Manhattan. Yeah. I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, hang on, I can't pronounce their last names. You mean from uh, the board of T. Piace? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So T. Piace has existed for a while. What, what is Matt? I can't hear you. Say that again, Matt, we can't hear you. Yes, Louis Venaria. Uh, you might you remember to... him. He's an actor. He was on, uh... He played Crazy Mario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On uh, Bronx, the Godfather yeah. of Harlem now. He's, and, uh, okay, and okay, brother, Mike, okay. All right. Who's a singer with Trey Bella. They're performers. And they're on the board. On it's going to be an exciting board. Yes. And who's the fifth? And who's the fifth one? So uh, there's the guy that sings with Trey Belli. And it's Joanne... Robert Tozzi is the last name. Joanne Robert Terzi. Didn't know that. They're off. No, when was Ti Piace founded? Two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. So is CCM gone? Gone, gone. What's over there? It's, it's, it can either exist or not, but it's not a part of this. It, whatever's hey. being done is being done. You got it. The, the, the heart and soul of the, of the organization or of the feast left that organization behind, and they're joining the new organization. They have nothing to do with CCM. So it will exist, not exist, get dissolved by proclamation, it's up to them. And, and succeed doing something else. Whatever it does, it does. Yeah. Okay, we're watching. 
when you talk about the uh, group of individuals who helped you with the vendors, is it the same identical group as in years past, or is it going to be different? Well, I, I handled vendors, so it, it would, that was always me. Mm-hmm. I, I guess the, I guess the real question is 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 any member of CCM of Westchester, whether present or past, going to be involved in in your organization? No. no. Well, that's not really true. You guys all are. Oh, yeah. other than me and Ralph. Yeah. Other than you and Ralph, I just, you know, we just got to be clear and transparent about this. Yes. Yeah. No, we. Well, you nothing to hide. The feast was always. It's a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, event in town. It's just fantastic. It's a great event. I grew up. I mean, everybody feast, loves it. it. Yeah. And Mike, we, we, you are aware that there is a new fee structure being imposed to events in town? Yes. And you are committed to upholding that fee structure for your event? Yes. Any questions from the board on that, on that point? No, I don't think so. That was laid out fairly well. Everything was understood. Um, and, and moving forward, that's what you folks are ready for. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay, it. so you're essentially presenting that the Santander Feast in Yorktown is going to be on. It's going to be and on. And it's going to be hosted under T. Piace. T. Piace. And that you're open to new vendors. Open so anybody out there vendors. listening... Anybody you know, anybody who just launched a food truck or a new vendor, please reach out. Yes. Can they reach you personally? Do you want them reaching us? Uh, How can they I'm reach? I'm sorry, Luciana, can I just interject for a second? Sure. I, I, think it's, I think it's important, though, that the town board has a discussion about this because um, I know that many people have reached out to board members individually. I know I had a line out my, out my office and, uh, you know, basically to the parking lot once what transpired transpired and the town made a decision to break away and sever ties with uh, CCM of Westchester. So I want to make sure that the town board understands the conversations being had and is comfortable with what's being proposed. Yeah, I don't, have a, I don't think there's a problem with it. They're not, they're not attached to CCM in any way, shape or form at this point in time, other than they were there. They are now no longer and they're a different entity on the board of uh, a new organization that has no attachment to CCM, correct? I guess what I'm not saying is, do we want do we want to discuss this and come back to to TPH, aka, you know, pre American presentation, or are we offering this to hear out other people that want to run San Janeiro? My, my point is, this is not this is not. I, I wanted to make sure that the board has an opportunity to deliberate on this because it's a sensitive matter. We all know that. So I wanted to make sure that the board itself, as a whole, is comfortable allowing this particular group to move forward. That's all I'm trying to say. I know it's uncomfortable, trust me. And I know it's uncomfortable for members of the board, but we have to be, we have to be open and transparent about this and, and be leaders for the community here. So that's why I wanted to make sure that we had a, a conversation uh, along with members of this particular organization to make sure we understood the parameters that we're setting forth and what our expectations are. Mike, Ralph, a question that was asked of me, and, and just to give you a chance to explain it, there was um, there was the delay in the tax filing on with CCM, and you guys were board members. I do know that it was taken care of and, and corrected. Yeah, yeah, because what happened was, from what the accountant said, was that because of COVID, they weren't taking any, you couldn't file. So by the time, and then you pay in February. So by the time what it looked bad, three years was really not three years so there was really nothing wrong with the taxes you know what i'm trying to say right well i think it's important people understand yeah that no there was there was because uh, you know it's the way that you filed and then COVID hit and then the one year we didn't have the feast mm -hmm. so right. they weren't even accepting anything because they were so backlogged okay just want to make sure that yeah, that's that was a big question that, that people have asked and uh you know, just to get clarity on it, so this way people understand what, what actually occurred. Yeah. So what we're saying is that one, you took off one year, you probably had to, you probably there was a zero return or something that you might you have to file because it's an informational return, right? You guys are a charity. It's, yeah, it's information, exactly. Um, 
And so, and then on, on the other years, it was because of COVID, and you, you weren't able to file in a timely fashion because they weren't accepting filing. Exactly. Okay, but the bottom line is, this is, you brought this here, you've done this how many times? Uh, in Yorktown, six years. Six years, okay. So I, I like to believe that church and state don't play. So I'm happy, for, I'm happy to decide what, if you guys wanna take a minute and talk about it, but it's, they're coming here to an event. So the only thing we can really say yes or no to is do we wanna give Tipiace the San Gennaro event? We, under, we understand, understand the track record. We are not transparent to the events. We all know what happened, what didn't happen. We know what's allowed and what's not allowed. I hope that you will behave on, on a good code of ethics, right? I think, I think we could all speak up on that. I recognize there were a lot of delays with tax filings. Technically, for me, that's your business, not mine. I don't run your business, okay? You're just coming to the town to say, can we have this amazing event that the first thing I got from a lot of our patrons was, oh my God, are we not gonna have San Gennaro? Mm -hmm. So, I, Matt, what do, we, what do we do on this? Because I am a newbie, six months in. To me, they're coming here, and I think the bottom line is, hi, we're now, I've been doing this for four years. I skipped a year because of COVID. I'm no longer with CCM, I'm with TPIJ. May I do my event from 914 to 918? Right, I, I'm gonna actually kick this to our town attorney, because uh, I think that a resolution would be a good move and that's something that adam i don't know how your feel what your feelings are on that free to do that um certainly doesn't hurt i mean but i can't is hear it, is it actually up to us to give given give an event i mean is, is that our role i mean they file for a, a permit to have the event and it goes through the permit process isn't that how it works i mean or, or do we have authority to give an event that's my question. I don't, I'm not really we have authority sure. to say, no, we don't want the event in our town. Okay, the event specifically. Yes. It would be like any other event. Like, like, I think what Sergio's asking is that, you know, do we have the authority to give it? And But they have to, in other words, it'd be like having a carnival, for argument's sake. They have to fill out the proper paperwork, do the right stuff. Right, they're going to have to put the permits in there. You know, get right. the permits and so on and so forth. So it's this is, this is in conjunction not sponsored by, I guess we say, with the town, correct? Adam? It's not a town sponsored event. Right. No, they're going to pay the, the fee. Right. They're they are paying the fee, event. and it's a lovely fee because we've changed the fee structure, and they're going to pay it. And then on top of that, they're going to narrow their donations to a very charitable local charity to put it back in our community or into a neighboring community that will affect the people of this community. So I just would like to understand what we're deliberating. What we're deliberating is this particular organization taking on the San Gennaro feast. And if the town board wants more time to deliberate on that, we we, we can. Uh, I'm not opposed to that. Okay, but so I think, I think this needs to be done in a transparent manner so that the public understands the particular steps that we're taking A, to ensure that those we partner with are honest brokers, B, that there's gonna be a fee associated with this event mm -hmm. and that we're taking every step possible to make sure those who we partner with uh, uh -huh. understand the values of our community. Did, have, have, have we vetted TPH at all? We don't have to vet TPH. They just have to fill a permit and the permit has to be approved. TPH is, is its own company. We have to trust that they're gonna bring us a, a person that- We still have due diligence. Yeah. To we still we still have due diligence. I know Mike offered their uh, their nine nineties. That would be a good well, idea, you know. So there there's still. You do know, we do that every time somebody files a permit? We ask them we, for the nine ninety. We we probably should if it's a, a big non for profit that that qualifies for filing nine nineties. But it's a non for profit that's bringing a saint that's also saying I'm going to pay my fee that goes with my permit. Use honest broker is the the term that Matt used a few times not disparaging and and mike automatically said we'll send you the paperwork not a problem it's he did. i get no i hear that but i guess i feel like if i was in his position and i just trying to just play you know I, i'm just voicing this i if i'm bringing i'm bringing it in good faith so part of the permitting process should be yeah exactly a, but that's on the that, permit side not on the town board side isn't it don't no, we get but it the fact of the matter is that we've been burned unfortunately recently uh, as it relates to this event. So I don't think that it's un, 
fair for the town board to take additional steps to make sure that whoever we welcome to our community to put on this event, and this is a great event, it's a great celebration for our community and the Italian Americans in our community, uh, there's no doubt about that. But I think it's important that we're taking the, the, the proper steps to make sure that whoever we're going to uh, uh, partner with as a community, and I, and I don't mean that as a, as a town sponsored event, but partner in the sense that we're allowing them to host an event in our community, that, that we know who they are and that we feel comfortable enough to allow them to move forward in, uh, in, in a certain manner. So, so Mike, how long, when do you typically start planning? You've done it for six years. When do you typically start planning? I know the answer, right? But it's like yesterday, right? So, yeah. but when do you typically start planning? How much time do you need? You know, that kind of stuff. Because well, I know it's it, a big event. Yeah, and for, it's, uh, for certain, it's getting close. It's getting close. It's getting close to where it's not going to, we can't do it. Okay. Yeah, because after a while, you know, the vendors start booking. Uh, and you start to lose entertainment, uh, uh, the rides. People need a commitment. I know, I know. I know you, you know how it is. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know. I understand that. Yeah. 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 Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we look? He offered the 990s. I don't have a problem with, with the event. I don't have a problem with you guys. I, you know, I just I think for the town to do its due diligence, we take a look at the 990s. We do a little vetting. What do you say, Matt? And uh, and then we come back and make a decision. If, Fill out the applications. If, if, yeah, I was going to say, have you filed for the applications and all yet? No, not yet. Okay. So that probably I didn't know what was going on yet. Yeah. So. Right. So I probably mm -hmm. file the, with the applications, the 990s, and you know, we'll we'll check those things out. And okay, sooner you can get them I, in here, the better okay. off it would be, right, Matt? Yeah, I think I think sharing the documentation that you offered. Um, would be great. Any documentation on on the, on the organization itself, uh, in addition to the 990s, but also, you know, the, the you know you, you rattle off some names on the office that's sent over to our town attorney, uh, and then you know, assuming that all works, then just applying for the permits. Okay. What do you guys think? I have nothing to review. I'm good. I think we, I mean, we made it very clear about what happened. I'm not going to blame them for what happened. So I'm not. Thank you for coming. Thank I you. look forward to seeing your permit. This is brand new to me. I recognize that we have to go through all this due diligence. But if we're going to have to go through all this due diligence, then, geez, we should go through this exact due diligence on every permit we get. Because the truth is they're not responsible for somebody else's actions. Correct. And everybody has to fill out a permit for whatever they want to do or should be filling out a permit. I'm sorry. But, um, can we ask? Can we ask the town clerk what she requires when someone files a permit? Do you, does the town clerk re review those documents? Do you require those documents? Is that a policy change that we can implement? Well, it's part of the code. So if you wanted to change the code, you'd have to do it by local law to do that, and and add in there that you would like to see certain documentation from any group that may come in and apply for a permit. Right now, they have to apply for a permit. We require insurance. Um, obviously to hold the town harmless. Um, we also require all food trucks to be licensed when they're on public streets in the town. Um, you'll get a street closing permit from me. The event permit itself or any parades like that you'll get from the police chief. So there's different um, departments that they will work with to do that. But there, you know, it gets sent to the highway department, it gets to the fire chiefs. Everybody reviews their plans and layouts. Just trying to make sure we don't we don't make mistakes, you know. Again, so uh, you know, if it's sharing up uh, with our procedures, I don't think it's a bad thing for us just to take a hard look at it. I. But it's up to the town board. It's a town board decision. So whatever you know, whatever the majority of the town board says, that's how we'll that's how we'll proceed. Well, Mike, you're going to submit those other. Yeah, I'll submit them. Paper, whatever right? you need, I'll so submit. So we'll do that. You get your permits in order. Yeah. And, yeah. and and we go from there. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm comfortable. You know, we've known each other a long time. Long time. And and I, I, I can say that basically, um, you know, I trust I, I trust Mike and, and that uh, I think that he'll do the right thing for the town. 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. You. And, and yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I don't, nothing precludes you from filing for a permit. Yeah. You know, I mean, we can't tell you, no, you can't file for a permit, you know. So I, I say I say move forward, file for your permit and then um, and then we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. You volunteered, right, in this instance to, for, for your 990s. That, that's great. Yeah. So we'll take a look at that. I'll have, I'll have everything in what you need. The only thing, like I said, it's coming down to the wire. Yeah. You know I got you. I understand. And then we have to start putting deposits and so. Right. So the quicker you get going. The quicker, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have everything by you Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Are you reminding me that it's almost Christmas? Because it's oh, June, because of the feast. so it's almost there. Yeah, yeah once the feast Six happens. Yeah. I shop in July. I shop Christmas. Okay. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Thank I you. I don't have any other questions. I'm good. Thanks, like everyone. Thoughts, I know why. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. Ciao, buona sera. Okay. All right, next we're going to welcome to the podium John Tegeter, uh, our director of planning. We're also going to invite Ken Belfer up from the Community Housing Board and have a discussion about updating our affordable housing law. This is something that we were uh, been in discussions with uh, with uh, Westchester County uh, as part of our compliance with East of Hudson funds so that we can move forward with the Hallettsville sewer project. Uh, there are a couple of proposed revisions to 300-39 uh, that uh, would modernize the law. John or Ken, who's going to take who's going to take a shot here? Okay, uh, you know, Matt, it's uh, dangerous inviting me up to the podium, so I'm going to live up to that reputation by making a couple of introductory comments. Um, it's been uh, interesting following the Toll Pro Brothers presentation tonight, and you know what we've seen is a flurry of development proposals and some big ones coming to Yorktown. Why all of a sudden? Well. Um, there's a tremendous need and demand for housing, and developers know that they can make money building it. Um, so we're seeing a lot of activity, but that also presents a historic opportunity for us. When developers can make money on 2,600 square foot homes, um, why should they focus on less expensive, more affordable housing? That's the reason uh, why, if you think it's good public policy to have some, a mixture that includes some less expensive, um, smaller housing, um, that's the reason to require it through an affordable housing set aside, um, where you leverage the private market by requiring inclusion of affordable housing. Along with the uh, proposed revisions to Section 339 um, that the Housing Board submitted, we also su resubmitted the draft affordable housing set-aside law for your consideration. So um, two things. I want to um, ask for a broader work session discussion at the Town Board's convenience to uh, discuss a number of things, including Yorktown's existing affordable housing um, program, small that it is, um, to discuss the set aside, I hope. Um, and second of all, um, I'd like to encourage you, uh, and this has been on the table for a while, to invite uh, Norma Drummond, uh, County Planning Commissioner, to come and do a presentation to Yorktown, similar to ones she's done at other, uh, in other communities on the affordable housing needs assessment study the okay, county did. Okay, but we could did. discuss that in the, in the more elaborate yeah. work yeah. session, right? Yeah, but I, I'd encourage you to, you know, not hesitate and invite curious, her to come yeah. because there's a section on Yorktown and it will give you background information about the needs and the housing stock in Yorktown. Great. So that being said, as, as Matt indicated, concerns came up from the county regarding Section 339. Um, and they were encouraging Yorktown to make some changes. Um, we made some changes and we also took the opportunity as long as we're going through a process of making changes, let's just try to clean up some things and make some improvements. So I'm not sure how you want me to proceed. Um, I prepared a summary of the presentations. I prepared a red line version. Do you want to give it to us law. to review? Would that be something? However you'd like to proceed. I, I can hand out 
uh, the summary right now. It's yeah. pretty simple. Yeah, like I could yeah. walk through it if you yeah, want. Yeah, we could do a quick or, summary or not. It. Yeah. Okay. Because I know that there's there's more deep diving to do in it around it. Good to have a little out. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Kelsey. I have it. Thank you. <clears throat> So um, I don't know if you want me to walk through it uh, or not. Sure. It's, um, okay. So you know, there's you know really a, a small number of changes. Um, first, uh, and uh, this was probably the thing that really um, came to the county's attention most in the definition of affordable mm -hmm. housing in the section. It, it said only units which have been established as affordable as of August 17th, 1994 shall be subject to the provisions of this section. So we're recommending deleting that section because that sort of sends a message to the county. Yorktown doesn't want any more affordable housing. Our only affordable housing law is, is only dealing with things Mr. that happen. Mr. Tansman, we, we see your sign. You can put it down now. I can hold it. Actually, you can, actually, you can. Actually, it's pretty sweet. Why not? Um, why am I being? But I read it already. Okay, I want you to see it on and on and on. Oh, okay. I have a right. Okay, we um that's in section B. Uh, section D three, um, we revised slightly to to provide the opportunity to do a lottery to select people from a waiting list. When you have a lot of people apply at once it becomes impractical to you know date stamp everyone when the mail is delivered all at the same time and it's a very fair and established way in affordable housing okay, okay. Can you just give them the number of people who applied the last time we had that one house come up just to talk about the need sure and i think we'll Thanks, in another work session we'll get into that but there are uh, you know 550 ballpark uh, applicants when we resold uh, a house so you know a for demand. one unit Wow. Um, oh. Anyway, so the second thing was um, providing the option of, of using a lottery. Uh, third thing in section. Excuse me, Ken. This, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you. Did, don't we use a lottery at this point in time? Well, we did, but it, it wasn't in this section. It was to add it to the section. Yeah. So we're revising the section to conform to good practice. Okay. Um, section D5. Um, and uh, you know, I should say, you know, I have other members of the housing board, um, Sarah, Sonia, and Mike, here with me. Um, um, section D five um, relates to how we market the units, and this was another issue that the county raised. And section three hundred thirty nine was basically silent on it, so I'm adding. Um, to ensure broad, yeah. Yeah, all affordable units, whether for purchase or for rent, shall be broadly marketed in a fair and affirmative manner. Such marketing shall include referral to the County of Westchester's Home Seeker website, which that last part, you already passed a resolution to, to that effect, I believe. Um, section E2B, um, now we're getting into more technical things um, that are you know, mostly to conform to county requirements that either come from, and I don't know that we need to get into each one of them. No, right and now. we can if we yeah. have questions yeah. around it or want to yeah. strengthen the language or whatnot. So they're either, you know, designed to conform to the county practice of how they define affordable housing or how they set affordable pricing or just to make, make the, the language work better. Right. Um, Sometimes that's really the key. Uh, and uh, same thing in section E3, A and B. Uh, in the original 339, there was no differentiation between setting the original sales price when a unit was- To the initial price. Versus setting resale price mm -hmm. when a first homeowner now is selling it to, to the second homeowner. So just clarified that. Uh, it's like almost like we're keeping the affordable housing affordable by making sure, you know, it's like, it, even in its own law, we have to make sure that it stays. Yes. Section A4B, um, when we last revised this, um, in setting rents, we felt there should be some kind of objective formula that everybody can easily look up anywhere, the developers, you know, or, or managers of properties in an ongoing basis for rental housing will know what to expect, what, what will meet their budget. 
Um, we were using low home rent and high home rent, and we had a formula that if the size of the unit was over 120% of the minimum size, then it would be high home versus low home. We are proposing simplifying it and just using low home, which is far more affordable. Sometimes high home is, is borderline really not affordable at all. Um, and not having to do, you know, measurements of square foot to come up with which, which one it is. Um, uh, Section E4C um, deals with minimum floor area. We're simply conforming one particular unit size to the county's model. model. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Section 4E again is deleting references to high home rent. Um, using the now we're on the last two. Um, section E7 um, is just a clarification that if something is, is affordable, let's use Keir Street as an example, something that's built with um, low-income housing tax credits through the state of New York and other county and state funding. It comes with all sorts of its own deed restrictions and guidelines of how you set rents and everything. So this is just to say that in that type of case where there's government funding mandates for requiring affordable housing procedures that this doesn't apply, that those override this. Last um, section um, F1A, um, the Housing Board felt this important um, that um, the, the section basically uh, uh, 339 establishes the Community Housing Board and you know, outlines its duties to administer the affordable housing program. Um, in many cases, um, communities that have a, an affordable housing set aside, for instance, the county willingly hires a not-for-profit to administer it for the towns. The town doesn't have to have volunteers or staff who do the affordability calculations, et cetera, who go out and show housing units for resale. So we thought that we should build in that flexibility in here. And that's it. No, it's good. So we'll get back to you again on, on the work session. Okay. Yes, JT. Any questions for me? Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. <clears throat> oh my. Because I, I can. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll just clarify a couple things before you go on, if you don't mind. Sure, John. Thank you. Uh, so, just for the benefit of everyone in the audience, this is our existing law on the books that governs the affordable housing program for the. 12 or so units that are in that program? Nine, I think. Nine. Okay. So these modifications, you know, the ones that um, Ken went through, most of them, just bring up to date much of the, uh, you know, to, to a standard, the current standards, what size of apartments are, things like that. And it, and it adds some guidelines in terms of managing th those programs, uh, i.e. the lottery. Uh, the one that I think that we had talked about earlier was removing the, um, the date, which allows, it, it's not a set aside, but it, it does allow uh, a volunteer, uh, a developer volunteering units into the program. That, that's all it does. So, which, by the way, they could do via the county anyway. They could do right? via the county. They could do via fed, other federal credits that um, Ken alluded right. to that Keir Street availed themselves of. There's the other uh, Underhill Apartments that has a uh, tax abatement program as well. So yeah, there's, there's some things. But. Um, this might be for Ken. Uh, we only have nine affordable units throughout the whole town. It was 12, he said. Or 12. No, we, we have more than. Yeah, what we're talking about, what this legislation was originally for, is for Yorktown's, the town's own affordable housing program, which was primarily for home ownership, although there were a couple of rental units created under the program. The program started in by re town board resolution in 1988, in which the town board at that time recognized that there was an issue with the affordability of housing in town and wanted to, for instance, uh, make sure there were housing opportunities for town volunteers, uh, I mean, a fire, you know, ambulance, uh, <coughs> municipal employees, et cetera. But there were many things behind it, but the town started its own program. 
and that program resulted in the creation of units, um, largely because the town said to developers, do you want to build this subdivision, um, you know, if I can think of strawberry me meadows, uh, you know, as one in uh, the northern section of town. Um, well, Bridge one, the right? Bridal Ridge include, we would like you to include affordable units in the development. And there was some negotiations, some developers gave land, some developers provide an affordable unit that they built, um, and then they sold through the town of Yorktown's program. And those are the units we're alluding That's to. The there, were, there were 13. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot of learning uh, at the beginning, and there are different deed restrictions in different units over time as the program evolved. The, one of the painful lessons was if you structure the price appreciation, because in affordable housing you get something way below market and you can't then just sell it for windfall profit, so you restrict how much uh, uh, the owner can the make on resale, and that helps keep it affordable for the next people. Well, the formula that was used initially was, was, very, was faulty and nobody realized it. Uh, there was a time of high inflation and it resulted in the formula taking the first units which were in the courtyard development right out of the affordability range um, very quickly and that created a problem. So th those are most of the units we lost. We also lost a unit in New Chalet which is a, another story that... So I have a question for you. So uh, in the Yorktown program we had 12, now there's 13. nine. 13. Yes. 13, now there's nine. So, but, but in your town, right, if you include any type of affordable housing, and I just would like to get, you know, the yeah. difference. How many units do we have of any type, any and every type? What, what would that number be? That's the kind of thing that we want to present during another work session. So All right, but yeah. You need to step yeah. up to the mic. But what would be that number? Do you have, yeah, do you, you guys know. don't know that number? It's a lot. It's a lot? Yeah. yeah. I think it's per capita throughout the county, one of the highest. That's what I'm saying. I think we have so to deep dive. I, I may be able to find the numbers while the conversation continues. It, but I'm, just, I'm just curious. I am the, the assessor. I, I'm sorry. I thought it was 300 to something. 368. 368, according to our assessor, and that was as of last year. And that includes the uh, the the current nine. Everything. That's everything. 368. Okay. okay. That's that's Keir Street. That's um, Coach and Four, Winwood, Allen Ave. That's, you guys are here. It's literally everything. Yeah. Yeah. Does that include Beaver Ridge? Yes, it includes Ridge. Beaver Ridge as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you guys are here Windward because Oak. you try and expand Yorktown's own program. Mm -hmm. Right? That That's what the, okay. So I was a little confused because I'm like, I know we have more than nine. Yeah. No, no. But now, <laughs> and you brought me up to speed with that, Ken, a, a while back. And I, I've had some conversations with Mike Matone, and he's explained, um, um, you know, some some the, the intricacies that I, I didn't understand. Yeah. And I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, well, we, we would like to come back and fill you in more, show you, give you a PowerPoint presentation in which we show you pictures of the units and yeah. give more information. Sounds good. So, so Ken, I, I actually just, I had a couple questions, if I can, Ken, or, or John, really. Ken, I, you know, so I know that it was a lottery system for Keir Street, correct? <clears throat> So I believe yes, yeah. I believe so. So county runs the lottery, we don't. So this is just to try to standardize a system. And if I'm not mistaken, off, off the top of my head, and and we can present this when we, when you give us an opportunity to come back. I think five out of the twelve units at Keir Street wound up going to people from Yorktown. I, I would love to have that number because um, that 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 sort of tends to to lean towards my next question. So the Yorktown program, as stated, was set up to help local volunteer fire. Our, our, we have volunteer ambulance and, yes, and, and people, right, people with, with, that are doing community things and don't have a high, high salary. Now, I know since the 80s, a lot of that has flipped between, you know, with the teachers and, and police and fire and God bless what they do, you know, no, no, uh, hard feelings about that you know I th think it's well deserved so my question though sort of runs in into you know I I really believe in helping those people that are helping the community so uh, 
in our in our program currently is it restricted to who can apply and if it is or isn't you know isn't it possible to limit within that community uh, I understand there's a you know there's a hey we want to open it to everyone but the the program was set up for a specific reason and there's also economic yeah, it's, like there's a program. it's not <clears throat> a question of we want to uh, open it up to everyone or don't want to open it up to everyone it's really a question of legal issues you um, that um, there are fair housing issues for example um, the town of Yorktown was subject to litigation about this a number of years ago. It wasn't directed at the affordable housing program. It was directed at the Section 8 program at the time. And there was a settlement to that litigation that required that the town adopt a, a non-discrimination policy. And, and town officials at the time had all get trained in fair housing. And one of the requirements was that the affordable housing program, this section, 300. 39 drop any residency restrictions you can't you can't do that you just like you yeah. can't pick and choose if you're if you're a landlord who could rent based on characteristics or traits or race creed or color right you, you can't do that um, so that to your question uh, the any unit would have to go in and I was I was trained here <laughs> any Mike any unit would have to go into the lottery system which, which is, uh, right. extend, I think extends in, uh, in a small portion of Jersey, a small portion of Connecticut, Bronx too, right? It's, it's, it's a That's, wide swath. Is now you're talking or? about something else, which is the oh. county's own program for their units that they created under the settlement agreement with with HUD and the not-for-profit and the lawsuit. We, we have nothing to do that. That's, no. that's not what we're talking about here. We don't have to advertise specifically to New Jersey or to any particular county. We just have to make sure we're advertising in a fair way and in a broad way right. and that we're reaching out to all, all ethnic groups. Which would groups. be the whole point of it anyway. I mean, why, why would you advertise it? You know, if, you, if you're trying to diversify, why would you limit but, your advertising? When, when we present, the other sense. thing I'll present to you is, is I looked at some of the neighboring communities and who won spaces in their lotteries for their affordable housing units, for instance, in Baldwin Place. And guess what? There are quite a few people from Yorktown who went there that way because there's nothing here. to get the affordable housing. So it works both ways. When you're doing it through a fair system, such as a lottery, yes, you can't restrict it, but that's not the just more but you're also not excluding people from wins. yorktown and you know yeah no because a, a, one of the misconceptions is that um you know uh, the, the yorktown affordable housing program is for yorktown people and you can't do that and you know i think that needs to be really clarified because that's really one of the big misconceptions but thank you ken thank you thanks so much so we'll let you know on the work session. We'll get in touch with you. I'm assuming if you want to move forward with the revisions that there are steps that you need to take uh, to put it in local law format, to refer it out. Uh, Correct. Um, We're going to let our attorney deal with that. <laughs> Adam, did you have any comments on any of this? So <clears throat> I did review the draft just quickly before the meeting because, you know, Ken did send it over in advance, but it, I didn't have a lot of time to think it through carefully. Um, you know, I'd like to have an opportunity to do that, um, and then I can brief the board any concerns I have, and we can go from there. Appreciate that. So, Ken, just one more question. So, touching on, I think, what Councilman Lachterman was talking about. If we change the date uh, from, in Section B, the first line, from August 17, 1994, it doesn't automatically opt anything in. It gives the builder the opportunity on new construction to possibly uh, at, at, at their discretion. I, I don't want to create any misconceptions here. And in, in my view, these changes don't create a single affordable housing unit. And that's why we resubmitted the set aside law at the same time. They don't preclude any from being in the program that may come in the, in the future, but they don't create any, they don't require any. Right, right now, uh, uh, we, we leave it up to the builders to say, I'm going to build two houses or we're going to build one house uh, affordable in the 10 we're building, whatever the case might be, uh, if, I'm not if I'm not mistaken. 
Well, when it was a policy of the town to encourage that, um, we got units. Um, when the town stopped encouraging it, we stopped getting units. Why would a developer voluntarily you know, make less money or even lose a little money on one unit in a, in a development uh, you know, of 10 or 20 um, you know, if he doesn't have to? So uh, developers know what Yorktown is requiring and what other municipalities are requiring. Yeah. and what you want to see in your community. And if you say, yay, we want um, lots of 2,600 square feet units for seniors to downsize to, that's, you know, they're, they're, they're fine with that. And then we, and I know we had gone through a density bonus, I'm sorry, we went through a density bonus too on if the, if the contractor wanted to put a affordable house up, then okay, you could put this other house up on that particular other piece of property. Yeah, and that's a great point with the density bonus because we've really never seen projects with densities like we've had recently and typically when ken talked about the profitability of a project right a lot of times when you see affordable housing development and set asides and things of that nature in neighboring communities they're in developments that have larger densities because the density allows them to still recognize a profit while providing affordable units to individuals or families that need affordable housing such as you know seniors folks that work in civil service, fixed income individuals, people with special needs or in, you know, in need of special assistance. So that's why when we looked at you know, the, the, the law now and then we resubmitted the set aside, it was with in mind the fact that we're seeing proposals with large densities that typically would attract affordable housing mixed use because the developer can still profit off of a project like that. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yes. Appreciate it. You guys are all set. We don't want to rush you off or anything like that. You're all set. Okay. We're not taking any soccer fields. Nope. No. <laughs> Would you like to build one? <laughs> football, maybe. Okay. Football. <laughs> hey, and it's and football another, and another lake for polar plunge. There's no. All right, let's go on to our last item on the agenda tonight, which is a boutique hotel special use. This is uh, language that's been being worked on by our director of planning, John Tegeter. We also have Michael Grace. Can you guys tip my uh, screen down a little bit more so I can see some kind of there you go. Poor Matt. <laughs> a little bit more. It hits all it stands up to. Otherwise, you're gonna fall over. You're gonna you fall over. You're right, the ceiling. Good. You're gonna bump your head. <laughs> we don't want you bumping your head. You're gonna bump the helmet. No, it's good. I'm all right here, Tommy. All right, this jacket. All right. Grace, Mr. Negator, you want? Did he freeze? Yep. I think he did. Cool. You want me to wait a minute? No. Go okay. Are you All right. back? So, um. Me? I never left. He's back. Oh, you froze, froze on, on me. Screen, but you I'm going to take you down. Oh, there, there you go. From there, because they're going to bring up a. <laughs> there you are. Anyway. It's saying you're unstable, Matt. Uh, what do you know? <laughs> okay, Nothing so. I haven't heard before. <laughs> He's gone. So we had a discussion about this law about a month ago, and it was for the boutique hotel, uh, which is a special use permit, uh, and there, it's about a page and a half or so. Um, after that meeting, uh, Adam and I went through some of the things and made some modifications, um, which you have now. Um, one I will point out um, is that some things were, were taken out that just didn't really apply. And the one that I want to draw attention to was that there was an allowance to allow height of 55 feet, which uh, I think uh, if you look at one of the projects that uh, is representing the boutique hotel has a clock tower, which is not subject to the height requirements because it's an architectural element. So I think maybe that's where the 55 feet came from. Uh, in the um, overlay district law, there is a height re um, limitation uh, that states you can do a rooftop enclosed space of 50% of your floor area. And you can, if you do that, you can increase the height allowed in the underlying zone by 25%. Okay. So that gets you to about 44 feet, which through discussions, and I'll leave it to Jorina to make any clarifications through discussions with Joe Rena, I think that that will accommodate very closely what um, the folks want to do. So my recommendation was to remove the 55 feet because that will be 
that would have been the highest height here in Yorktown allowed. And I didn't know that really it was wise to go to that extent if we didn't have to, and I didn't, I'd feel that you had to. So anything else really, I mean, it, this is a pretty clean and easy law. I'm sure you read it in about, you know, a couple of minutes, so I don't want to belabor the points of... We don't uh, buy air rights here in uh Not yet, but we're up. working towards there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Honorable we, Michael we've, Grace. We've got no problem with, you know, we suggested some of the bulk and area requirements to this to accommodate the one project that you do have in front of you and also being cognizant that you know may you may have them in the future but right now this is you know it, it basically is the one project and we have no problem with the with the uh, amendments as suggested by uh, the planning department on this one my one concern is that um, my understanding is that there's there's a lawsuit pending uh, in regard to the overlay and uh, we would we since this is new legislation which you would uh, put out for public hearing we ask that maybe you pull it out of its tether to the overlay itself uh, so that it doesn't get caught up in that litigation and I think there may be some there may be maybe some good reasons for doing that um, in terms of the the uh, the location of the particular property that we're talking about and, you know unless my, I'm not you know I don't want to make any pretense with this is obviously being brought in front of you uh, because of that particular project. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I think that you are all, all learning with all the different things that are coming in front of you and that uh, your zoning code, which is decades old, is not necessarily keeping up with what the needs are of the town. And it seems like every time, some, every time I'm here, it, Diana said, uh, constantly put me at the end of the agenda I said no it's bad because then I get to hear everything else that goes on and <laughs> <laughs> but put him first. <laughs> yeah put me first so this way I don't have to I can keep the blinders on but and the and the earmuffs but uh, what I'm saying is that you, you, you're starting to learn that and it, it's a challenge it's a challenge for every administration that um, your zoning code has to be you know it's, it's, it's a constant process of updating and keeping uh, pace with what the town needs uh, and where you want to see the town go uh, and I think it's very important because there's a lot of things that the, you know the, you know what, what 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 worked in the 50s in the 60s and the 70s doesn't work anymore today so it has to evolve to meet yes and and, and you want to keep the you know the you want to keep the nature and the character of the town intact and if you don't keep up with what the trends are and where ne things need to go, what you end up getting is plight. Mm -hmm. And and you have a lot of, you know, and you, you don't have to look too far to see that you have properties that are very valuable uh, and can be very viable, uh, commercial and uh, community uh, um, ser orientated uh, services and goods and uh, that aren't lying fallow. Uh, because of not being able to plug into the zoning. I think that for most people that want to come in and do something, the first thing they do is look at the zoning because that's the biggest challenge. And when that's an impediment, you can get people to sh shy away. So I, just for the sake of being you know, completely what they call transparent, um, which is a term I... I you know, I would think I'm always being truthful, <laughs> uh, but it, it, this is really the, the law is designed to, to see if we can can't accommodate this boutique hotel, and it uh, this is a trend these days to have these things in communities. I know there was some outcry about why would anybody want to spend two weeks in Yorktown, and it was a big Facebook hue and cry about the last time I was here, and I think that uh, it's a shame to hear that because. Everybody should want to spend at least two weeks in Yorktown, right? <laughs> I and want to spend my whole life here. <laughs> but I would, the, po the, the, the point being is that if we really had the kind of vibrant, walkable, you know, attractive, aesthetically pleasing community that we all li like to envision, there would be a desire, you know, a demand for this, and that's what we want to see. So I think it's a good project, and one that would be vetted by the planning board, which is not an easy task <laughs> for anybody. But uh, you're tough, JT. 
but we're, uh, we're we're just asking consideration that there may be uh, that that we uh, when you put it out for public hearing that we can untether it from the overlay. from the overlay in, in order for this project to be going ahead independently of whatever may ha happen with the litigation. And what and what section of law will we be putting it in? Yeah, I was just going to ask that. <laughs> what? Well, this. No. I, let me just answer that. So. This is going in uh, an existing section of law. It'll be in the in the zoning code. It's not embedded in the overlay district. Would okay, it, so, would, John, would it be allowing uh, a, boutique, a boutique hotel to be proposed anywhere in town no, or just within the Heights? Just in the Heights, just in the Heights, me, in the in the heights right now. So you'll have to, uh, according to Mr. Grace's request, you'll have to look at that and you may have to do a, a, a line amendment for that. Uh, but right now, this is a special permit that will go in the body of the zoning law, not embedded in the overlay district law. And for this project to avail themselves in the overlay district would have to then come to you after this law has been enacted to go through that authorization to do to get into the overlay district. John, As I'm you sorry, recall. say that part again. Uh, I didn't hear it. So, so once this law will have to come to the town board and, and, and proceed through the overlay process. Yes. To, a, to a, be able to obtain this particular amendment, even if it's not within the overlay zone law? As it stands right now, yes. If you're going to accommodate Mr. Grace's re request, I think that we may have to do a line within the zoning that allows boutique hotels in a particular zone that this property lies. So therefore, they can follow this, not have to go through the overlay district. But, and but wouldn't, that, wouldn't that then allow? Yes. The, Yes. What is it? What is it zone right now? R three? No, no. It's C two, C two, C two R. C two. So, but then, C2R, but then R, essentially, right. what we'd be doing is allowing any C two. That's correct. That that's what you have to um, consider to accommodate the request, I believe. Yeah, and then, right. And, right. Yeah, and then, so, but in that, in that that regard, if you inventory your C two R zones, they're really just in the Hamlet areas, anyhow. Uh, the so thing. Uh, yeah, and so I, I don't think that's a, a major problem. The, only, the other thing is that uh, we anticipate using some of the um, variance authority that the planning board would have under the overlay, right? So to get to where we want to go, I, I, I just the reason why I bring it up is that it's a it's a good project. We'd like to see it move ahead. I think it's been vetted uh, at least to a certain extent with the planning board. Um, if it gets caught up in the issues with Soundview, you're basically losing a good project over having a haggle over another really good project, but you, you have that, you, that battle's been picked already. So, uh, we, we just don't want to be collateral damage in it. And I think that if we can, we can uh, go forward with the legislation that prevents that, from happening, Mr. We Grace, if we're taking it out of the overlay, but you need the parameters of the overlay, how how do you obtain the parameters of the overlay without it being in said overlay? I well, the, I, I, you know what I, I I think the way we designed the Aryan bulk, I'm okay because I think the the, the what John pointed out with the the uh, building height, the 44 feet. Yeah, we we we're, we're I think we're okay with the Aryan bulk as it exists. Well, that's in the overlay. Yeah, so so we would have to, you would have to go to a, uh, allow for the big boutique hotel to go to 44 feet. Everything else, I think, with the parking, um, everything else may may fit without having to to uh, go to the overlay uh, uh, um, flexibility that, that that exists in the overlay. But I think the height's going to be an issue. The only other way we could approach it is through a, a ZBA application. Um, which we can do as w well, which would be that we would go, get, go to the, the planning board, see where we deviate from the yard setbacks. The yard, yeah, and then, and then go to Joe, the ZBA what, what for that. that. What? What did Joe say? I couldn't uh, the, yard, the setbacks, the, the area, some of the setbacks would, w that we looked at would have to be varied as well. In other words, your, your overlay allows for certain flexibility and, and, and deviations from the underlying zoning, and and we would uh, without without being in the overlay or, or tethered to the overlay, we couldn't avail ourselves of that flexibility. So the only other way we could do it is put the application into the planning board, and then go to the zoning board for those variances, um, which is not not a, not a, not an undoable task. 
just it's, it's another layer of approval. But if the if it if it I think if it passes muster with the planning department, the planning board, that may be the way to go. So we just it's 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 just something to think about, and I think it's something to think about anyhow because your 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 um, you know to be frank, your, your you know the overlay legislation was good legislation. Not only and, and I guess it's being challenged just on the heights, or it's being challenged up in trouble and uh, Osceola as well. Oh. So the thing is, is that it, it and it really ends up being concerning a particular project and not the rest of the areas that you're looking to develop under the overlay. So right. you, you may everything just everything else on ice. Yeah. So I, you know the other way you could do it. Great job. The other way, other way you could do it is you could you could repass the legislation or pa pass a second layer of legislation where you change the boundaries of the you know, overlay overlay district prime and then pull in some of the the properties that may should have been included in the overlay to begin with and leave some of the other ones out but to just have that so the 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 first legislation tracks with the litigation and the second legislation remains independent of that because uh, let's face it the truth of the matter is it's only about sound view that they're fighting mm -hmm. and yeah. you're going to get every you're going to get you know uh, the north end of town osceola and the rest of the heights area wrapped up in a, in, in in a fight that uh, isn't there is collateral, isn't there isn't collateral damage so there are ways to work around it uh, it's and uh, you guys as the town board have the power to design those workarounds and uh, we would like you to do it because I think this is a good project and it was well received. And if we want actually people to come to Yorktown and think and be enthusiastic about coming to Yorktown, what would be better than a nice boutique hotel with a rooftop bar and a tapas menu and to do it the way th this particular person does everything, which is just first class. And I think that uh, that's what we want. We want, you know, we don't want highway garages in our town we want these <laughs> hotels oh, <laughs> there it is I'm get into that debate right now I but i do that. think it's important for the town board to understand Thanks, Mike. Thank uh, you, that that we have we have some considerations that we have to discuss and deliberate on here uh and i'm just watching a stink bug fly around my head so i apologize <laughs> uh, we can't see you you can't see me oh good yeah uh, so you're okay we can. so thank you diana oh, Quas, for, for not making me on the big screen uh but <laughs> You know, what's the town board feel about pulling it out of the overlay district, which, you know, kind of just undoes everything that we spent two years doing. <laughs> right. Well, so. just let me just reiterate that this legislation, you should go forward with. Regardless, regardless. regardless. it's separate. You, ha you have to have the special use permit in order to affect a boutique hotel anywhere, really. <laughs> How you apply that and where it can go is the second question. So I just want to make that clear to you. I, I, I would agree with you. I agree. You, you have to. We have to have the special use permit standards in there, anyhow. And as to how you work it, we can always uh, approach that at, at, a, at a later date. I just bring I br bring it up because it's a concern, obviously, for my client. If we get caught up in the litigation as collateral damage, that would be unfortunate for my client. I think it'd be unfortunate for the town. Uh, and not just for this project, but for any other project that would be included in what you know is basically your well, overlay. Mr. Grace, it's a fair point. It is and a fair the point. The reality of, a, of, of the pending lawsuit having to stifle so much good progress that we were making in our town. But the town board, I guess, what do you guys, what do you guys think about uh, pulling it out? Well, I, I think we should definitely move ahead with the, the, the law, law, and yeah. then we can then we could discuss pulling it out. It's going to take us what six six to eight weeks anyway on the law, correct? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, the the special use permit standards are pretty straightforward. It doesn't require a lot of environmental reviews. Environmental reviews, as far as your my issue with the overlays, you can you can actually, you know, see so you 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 could do a second legislation using everything that you already have in place, but leaving the leaving the controversial yeah. property out so, so so to speak so if you you know you, in, in other words uh so if that because if the issue becomes whether it's sound view should be included or not be included or what's the issue with sound view that can go down its own track which is what's going but why get everything else caught up in it so you can pass legislation and you can talk to your town attorney but you can pass legislation say we're doing overlay prime it's going to be the same exact law 
based on the same exact environmental reviews, but its boundaries are going to be different than the overlay, f you know, f you know, the first overlay. So are you yeah. are you actually saying like pull out sound view instead of pulling out the? In other words, if I if I if, if you if, if yeah, so 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 you not your your over your the legislation that you already passed. You right. know, the beauty about doing so, this legislation, you can always it's like Groundhog Day. You can always do it over and over again. I don't want to do that until no. you get it right. But it, it, it's, it's the truth because you, you can go through the litigation, they can tell you what you did wrong and go back and you do it right and you put it back into place. The, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's, all I'm saying is that if it's the, if it's the boundaries of the overlay, overlay that you passed that is offensive to the li litigators, Move and, the boundaries? then you can re-legislate. Not disturbing, not repealing your first overlay, but just doing a new overlay, which has the same, which just has a more constricted boundary, and I can go over, I can go under that o overlay, yeah. rather than the first one, and achieve the same thing. And 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 I, I think you know, and it's not really changing the footprint of anything. In fact, it's shrinking the footprint. But it's, it's not, shrinking. But but yeah. the, but you know what? There, I, I'm going to tell you honestly. When I reviewed the overlay, and, uh, and it just as an aside. There are properties that probably should have been pulled into the overlay that were not that we would 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 could be, have been know, could have been should have been probably considered to being pulled in as well. So you you can you, you know legislatively you can make these corrections, and you don't you know you know you're, you're not uh, you're not doing anything untoward to the Soundview project because the Soundview project is the what, what's going to be challenged, and that's going to be da going down its own track anyhow, and if you prevail on the challenge. Then you back right where we are. Exactly where we are. And if you and if you don't prevail on the challenge, then you're going to have to do something corrective, vis-a-vis -vis what the Soundview property is. So there are ways of doing it. All I'm suggesting I, I, is. I honestly, I think we're like blind, bleeding into like more complicated water. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, like just, I'm just, I'm just. I do the special use permit, but I, 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 right. I bring it up because I'm no, here to advocate it. for my client, and I'm trying to just move the project ahead. And yep, I appreciate it. So uh, this is in local law. Does the, does the clerk have a copy? I don't have the updated copy as of yet. Okay. We'll, we'll get so. <clears throat> yeah, we, we'll get it to Diana tomorrow. Yeah, There's just one minor one. modification. Yeah, we have a typo we have to make. There's a little typo on uh, a reference to a section in urban renewal. That should just come out. So then once, once the clerk gets the uh, copy of the local law, then we can move ahead with resolution to set the public hearing. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sounds good. And refer out. And refer out, of course, there, Thank Madam you. Clerk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Any other comments from the board on that particular topic? No. Nope. Not right now. No. Well, you know what? I'll say that uh, someone sent an anonymous letter, which was against the program, uh, the, the hotel project, which actually was an argument for why we need it. Uh, it, it you know, and, and I think Mr. Grace alluded to it, where it was, you know, this person was like, why would anyone want to stay in Yorktown? And that's what, that's what this whole overlay district is about, and that's what the Osceola overlay district is about revitalizing these areas to make Yorktown viable and um, you know I thought it was a very a very good argument in favor of it even though it was a contentious and actually personalized uh, attack yeah. so I'd definitely like to see this uh, move ahead yeah they generally uh, when, when they do that they actually make the statement for something rather than it, against. against it yes okay all right, we want to move the resolutions? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, Councilman uh, Diana, do you want to read the, the, the resolutions? I, I don't know if my audio is coming in properly. Um, you know, the uh, one, the resolution we have after the, uh, the boutique topic, um, I would like uh, Luciana to read, please. Sure. Okay. <sighs> Resolution. Hate has no home in Yorktown. Whereas the town of Yorktown has once again been victimized by ignorant and disgusting words that were racist and anti-Semitic, and whereas the town of Yorktown rejects these actions of hate and views them as an attack on the fabric of our community, and whereas the town of Yorktown appreciates and applauds the swift action by the Yorktown Police Department 
in, pro in processing the crime scene and referring it to county law enforcement agencies for their assistance. Whereas the town of Yorktown has and will continue to stand united against the infiltration of hate and racism within our community now. Therefore, be it resolved, the town of Yorktown requests permission from the New York State Department of Transportation to turn the area violated by racist graffiti into a mural that emphasizes unity and acceptance. I'm like, I'm gonna cry. Be it further resolved that the town of Yorktown will direct its Arts and Culture Committee to organize the parameters to accept proposals for the mural to be approved by the town board. And be it further resolved that the town of Yorktown is determined to turn this slight against our community into a positive moment of reflection and education for all. Very nice. So moved. Exactly what Second. you Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any, any comments from the board? I know that the, uh, the chief of police and the department is working very hard in trying to determine who may have done this hateful act. Um, they have reached out to the school resource officers um, uh, association that they have where they have different type of tags and so on and so forth that they keep on file. Um, so, uh, but this is an active investigation at this time and, and there will become a conclusion to this active investigation and hopefully we will be able to remedy and rectify. Well, I love the, the mural idea. I know um, uh, that was brought up and, and, um, and, and, and the town reached out to, uh, to see if that would be allowed. I was happy to hear that it was. That was a few days ago. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing um, some of the presentation, you know? Yeah. You know, being someone who, you know, being Jewish and the anti-Semitic remarks and also the racist remarks, which, you know, to me is family, my, my godson being African, uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite, quite um, disappointing, you know, angering. Uh, you know, I, I know we've had a few instances very, very similar, and in each instance we find out it's children uh, that, are, that are out there uh, doing their graffiti, and uh, it's just such, a, such an awful thing. I, I just hope that, uh, I know, Matt, were you talking about someone coming uh, to talk? Yeah, and, we'll get into that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, programs like the Holocaust Remembrance that we do, uh, there are so many other programs out there, and uh, you know it's an educational block. There, there's there's something lacking where people don't understand the significance and the meaning of those words, and um, you know it's it's hopefully something that can be addressed on an educational level, more of the the history teachings and and what uh, what that hate has has strewn over the years. I think it's really important just to take a deep breath around it and just feel into like what the fear is when someone reads those hateful words and what that person must be going through. And I think it is really important that, yes, I believe it's education, but it's also teaching our community to stay within empathy and really sit with individual experiences so that we can offer compassion and understand historical trauma and where that comes from. And I know that um, Matt's gonna comment, but we are blessed to be living in a very safe community. And it is absolutely horrid and, and scary to see these incidents, but I do wanna assure that we cannot let hate lead to fear and then fear lead to more hate. I think it's really important that we feed this hate with, with love and acceptance and understanding and try to help educate not only the person that's out there with this hatred, but also the community, because learning about any of any differences of anyone, you can call it whatever you want, racial, you know, racial, um, you know, following the, the the Trevor Project that I do with the LGBTQ community, having an open arm and acceptance in your home base 
is crucial and it starts with our children all the way up. If it was a kid that had the graffiti, he learned it from somebody. And it's important that we reteach and reparent how to carry these sort of traumas. And it does start, and I hope that people utilize it, it does start with listening and coming to places of education. Um, it's, it's also very important to recognize and, and understand and, and embrace the, the stories of people that have fought uh, against you know all of these racial and religious indifferences. Um, you know, in in Greece, the the church took the chi the the Jewish children during the Holocaust and took them into their homes as distant cousins and and, and nephews and and hid them from the Nazis. And you know, there I had watched a presentation uh, during COVID. Uh, with the Holocaust Museum, and it was just amazing. It was in international. A lot of it was in Greek, actually, and translated. But uh, I don't think that, you know, I. you have to rally against the hate, per se. You have to, to learn to, to overcome it in a positive way, teach, embrace, as you said. and Well, uh, create uh, allyship. Yeah. Like, allyship is important. But, but I think it's really also important to, to realize that the majority of people fight against it. The majority of people are are working towards it, and it's and you see this in history throughout the years. There are there are breakdowns, and, and if we don't teach them, we don't remember them. But it's it's so important to to realize that you know there are decent, good human beings that fight against this, and and it's this, this few people that that destroy and 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 break that down. So. You know, we really need to, to get that educational out there and and really but understand that we all have options to combat this. Yeah, and I think I think it's you you, you get there with mutual respect because uh, even though uh, we all might disagree politically, I, I think we all uh, well this shouldn't be a political topic, but uh, we you know it it is something that I think most people are on board with. I mean, you know, like I said previously with the chamber, I, we hosted DEI workshops for, uh, uh, for you know, in, uh, in, in the office, you know, business settings, um, you know, to adults. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I think that that's an important mechanism um, because I think we all are on, most of us are on the same page. But um, I just want to share a truth of my own because I just feel like I need to be completely... Everyone needs to start taking ownership for their, their, own, their own self and their own behaviors. And it's really important. I understand that there, this kid, this, this human who wrote these horrible things could be from our town, not our town, but each one of us has family members. We have neighbors, we have friends. Teaching ownership and how we respond to things and how we treat other people and why we treat them and really self-reflecting is really important and we don't teach enough how to self-reflect. Am I being affected by this? Am I passing judgment? Am I approaching this incorrectly? And then there are forums throughout the country, there are books that people can read and they're offered and no one uses them. So. Well, the, the, the question is how, how do you get the people who hate to, 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 come, to, come, hate to, to come to the table? To come you know what, you just keep offering it, I guess, one day though. Matt, did you have anything? I have I have quite a bit that I'd I'd love to say, but I don't I don't know if I can even verbalize it at this point. Um, I can tell you I'm angry. I'm real angry. I spent I spent the weekend I spent when I found out about this the last couple of days very angry. I'm angry because I I just I'm angry because this does not reflect our community. I was raised here. I know the values of this community. I know what this community stands for. And to see this happen yet again, it makes me angry. It makes me angry because of the poor light that it puts our community in. And it undoes so much work that we've done. It undoes so much that we've accomplished, especially in the last three years. And it's beyond disappointing. I find it really heartbreaking and I just I'm just filled with anger that this continues to be an issue within our community that people continue to feel that they are empowered to bring such vicious hate 
to our community, into our community. We know racism exists. We know racism exists here in this town. We know racism exists Definitely. in every community across America. This is a national problem. And I started the day very angry. And now, now I'm sad because of what happened in Texas. Death toll is up to 18. We started this meeting at 14. And so if you don't think for a second that there are consequences for the disgusting and vile hatred that people are poisoning this society with, you're wrong. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely wrong. And this isn't a Republican issue, Democrat. I don't want to hear the politics for a second. My children deserve better, frankly. That's, what I, that's why I dedicate myself to public service, because I want them to live in a world where they don't have to hear about these things. I want them to go to school and not being afraid that they're going to become a, a casualty. That's what I'm fighting for. And I'm angry as hell that this is the world that we have created. And make no mistake, we've all played a part in it. Absolutely. One way or the other. It's completely unacceptable. So I'm just trying to keep my emotions in check here, but it's a, it's a hard day, a very hard day. Uh, I, I really do want to thank Chief Noble. Chief Noble has been spectacular, as always, uh, with the specific incident here in Yorktown, and also in response to this, 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 this awful tragedy in Texas. Uh, I know that he's taking proactive steps to ensure the safety of all the children of Yorktown as they attend school. We do have a school resource officer program, the best school resource officer program you can find in the state of New York. And I want to thank Dr. Hatter and the Yorktown School Board for helping us expand that. I just hope it's enough. And I'll be honest, and I'm being very transparent about this, my confidence right now is, is shaken. It's really shaken, not just about what transpired here in Yorktown, but what's transpired in the last and during this day. And, and I'm just heartbroken. We are working with experts uh, specifically about what happened here in town. I want to thank Millie Jasper of the Holocaust and Hum Human Rights Education Center. Um, we are in contact with her and we're working through uh, some programmatic uh, ideas with her, one of which that they have, which is fantastic, if we are able to apprehend the uh, individual or individuals responsible for spreading their vile hate in our community. They have their own education program to help turn them uh, basically around and help learn from this horrible incident. Uh, Mira Clark Siegel of the American uh, Jewish uh, Committee, the AJC, has been with us uh, the moment this story broke. Um, they've applauded us for our efforts, uh, both past and current, in combating anti-Semitism. And Mira is going to be joining us next week to provide a special uh, presentation to the town board and to the public regarding anti-Semitism. Uh, again, uh, just a really important conversation for us to have. And I really want to thank Councilwoman Howitt, because Councilwoman Howitt has been aggressively and proactively trying to get folks uh, in her orbit uh, to come discuss really important topics uh, regarding acceptance, regarding healing, things that we all need. We are living in a very angry world. A very angry world. And it's not, a, it's, not, it's not about... You know, I spent the last uh, uh, couple of days here at home. I've actually been able to watch the news in the morning. I got to tell you, we're now a society that feeds off of fear and feeds off of hatred because if you watch the news for every 10 negative stories there might be one positive that's not the world that i want to live in that's not the world i want my children to live in but all we're doing is perpetuating this hate and perpetuating this fear and i think councilwoman you nailed it it's a vicious cycle and today it costs 18 children their lives That's all I want to say. <coughs> I think we often say a special, special prayer tonight for the 
folks that lost their lives, the children, and I know there was one teacher. Uh, Matt, was there more than one teacher at this point in time? Yeah, the death toll has increased since the meeting started. Uh, so they, I think it was three more adults three in addition more. to the 18 kids. Um, for all the, for all the children, adults that lost their lives today at Ross Elementary School in Uvalda, Texas. This incident started at about 12.40 p.m. Texas time. This individual, before he left his house, from what I gathered, from what I saw before I came to the town board meeting, also killed his grandmother. And right now, this is a very fluid case that the police are, are working on very hard to try and find out why. And I just hope to God that there's not another copycat killer out there that's going to try something on another school somewhere else just because this madman did this. So please, folks, in your prayers tonight and always, remember these children and adults that lost their lives senselessly to one individual. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, do you want to move on to the other uh, re resolutions on the agenda? I think at this point we're, we're uh, no, wait, we have some authorized. Do you want to read them? Do you want me to read them? What's that? We have an authorized supervisor to execute an agreement with the County of Westchester for the town to conduct high visibility road checks, saturation patrols, and drug recognition expert call outs. We're going to authorize the comptroller to process a budget transfer. Uh, this budget transfer, uh, let's see. I apologize. Uh, this is a, a transfer for chips. Ships in the of recovery, and then we'll request uh, the New York State Department of Transportation. I'd like to amend this resolution, Diana, to request the New York State Department of Transportation inspect and clean, clean and maintain specific culverts. Uh, specifically, this is for Route 6 and Hill Boulevard. I would also like to amend that to include the uh, state DOT to review the timing of the traffic light at Route 6 and Curry Street, where there was a recently an accident. So moved. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? All right. With that, uh, we're going to be going back into closed uh, to discuss uh, a legal matter, and we'll be adjourning from there. As a reminder, uh, there is a, uh, while we did not originally have a town board meeting scheduled for next Tuesday, there will be a brief presentation now, a brief presentation, and then we'll be going into closed session. Motion to go into closed. Second. All Aye. 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 Good night, Yorktown. Good night, Yorktown.